Have you ever tried to make shapes with the uh, with the waveforms? Yeah. Whoa! I think we did it sassy. You can try and make a penis. Oh! No, no, not loud. wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh. I, I got it, I got it. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit of a chode. Oh! Ooh, it's not bad. Oh shit, hang on, that doesn't really work. Oh dear, that's, get some help. There we go, that'll do. This is a weird it's, outtake. It's an audio penis, there you go. <laughs> you need to make the balls like sharper. Hello and welcome to day 31 of the extended Genesis of Androzani advent calendar for 2019. For patrons, this is the final chapter in our advent calendar. All that hard work has paid off, hasn't it? Yeah. Even though some of it hasn't been done yet for us. But uh, anyway. I've done nothing. But... <laughs> <laughs> For patrons, this is the final chapter. Um, however, if you're watching this on YouTube, far down the line, because this one had the most gap between, um, hope you're enjoying... This will probably be in February. Oh, this will be uh, closer to March, honestly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, welcome to the Series 2 recap. It's been 18 months since we did Series 1, so Jake's viewing the show slower than it even came out. Yep. Yep. Um, like a fine wine. Mm, like a fine wine. Um, that you only enjoy half the time. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, but I, ha I do have a very important question, Jake. Mm -hmm. Specifically for you. Yeah. Ascended from the gods. Uh, what's the difference between your wife and your job? Oh, this is this could be sexist. Oh, no. I don't know. I'm not going to answer it because it could be sexist. Oh, well, I suppose I'll be sexist then. Yeah. Because I'm a host. Uh, after five years... Your, jobs will, your job will still suck. Ah. Ah. Mm-hmm. You almost look as red as your shirt. Yeah. So it's pink. Hey, anyway, uh, so Series 2 recap. Yeah, but Patreon.com. Ah, uh, Patreon.com. Slash Genesis Slash Genesis Genesis if you, if you wanna If you want to... Buy us some better joke books. Yeah. Please. Oh, God, please, we need it. Mm. Are you taking this from a joke book? I am looking up things online oh, okay. I suppose you could call it a book yep. bookmark but uh, Patreon's all there that's where all the early stuff came for this stuff and exclusive stuff and also requesting stuff yeah Jake's on the Patreon oh yeah I am yeah. <laughs> I, I bought it yeah what why from it? nothing because I can't I can't look at anything because <laughs> spoilers I mean you yeah. could I mean you, you're in the master tier so you could request something am I? You, yeah you're paying you're paying $10 mate oh shit alright yeah. I'll request, um, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll okay. Request right. soon. Sure. It'd be funny if you requested it and then we publish that video before this one comes out. <laughs> 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 this makes no sense. Oh, reverse section. Twitter.com slash Giandrazani is, um, is, a, is, is, yeah, we all know what that, that's all about, isn't it, don't we? It's good. It's good at times, I reckon. I'm sure it is. I reckon it's pretty good. It's friendly, except for when it's not. Um, but that's all the plugs, right? Big yeah. plugs, big plug, pluggy plugs. Why do you look so nervous? I'm not nervous. I'm just listening to what you're saying. I've just heard this spiel so many times. Oh, yeah. Too repetitive, eh? Um, I think the most interesting thing about this recap is uh, Adam wasn't there for the last three episodes of Series 2. Ta-da. So he has absolutely no idea what Jake thought of those because I haven't told him. So that's going to be a nice little mystery to unfold, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Without further ado, shall we begin this this spiel? Let's begin the journey. Um, Let's so, do it. Jake, because obviously you're the you're the, the the you're always in the hot seat. Yeah. The hottest burning fire seat. Yeah. Your initial sort of overview of seri without going like deep, deep, deep detail. Yeah. What are your initial you know sort of thoughts, overall thoughts, feelings on series two as a whole? Series two as a whole, um, I felt was was. Solid, a bit rocky at moments, and uh, and it had its had its highs and it had its lows for sure. Definitely more than than series one, um, but I still think the highs were very very good. 
the lows were quite bad. Mm. So, I think overall this is um, a series of television that sort of makes sense. You know, it's one it's one that you expect from from a show. Every show has this. You know, mm-hmm. every show's got got just a a, a good B plus. Mm. It's type series. Mm. So what you're trying to say is, is that this is sort of like the standard that you would hold the show to, but series one was like way yeah. more consistent, way yeah. up there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. You got, you got something else to say? No. no. Oh, okay. You got the you wanted to say something. Oh, I was gonna say, I was gonna potentially say, may look, at, but um, it would just open up a whole can of worms. But right. just like say it for later. Ah, uh, yeah, I might say it for later. Okay, sweet. When we get more in depth, uh, more in depth. Sure, sweet. All right, um, Adam, I am very much along the same lines. Uh, this to me feels more like what a pilot season of a show would normally feel like, because series one is so focused, so concise. There's some low, there are some lows and some lulls within series one, but the highs are so consistent, and it's like bang, 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 bang most of the way through. It's really, really good. Um, series two, I mean, obviously, much shorter turnaround, and there was more pressure and all sorts of palaver behind the scenes. Um, but I agree with Jake. It's sort of like a solid B plus season, where it's it's by no means bad, but there are some pretty low lows. But simultaneously, there's some very high highs. It's a very sort of up and down season mm. all the way through. And on the whole, I do like it, but there are flaws. Okay. And for me, um, so obviously, I think I made it pretty clear in the Series 1 reviews and the recap itself how I feel about that. I, as you know, love Series 1 to the point where it's probably my favourite. Like It's it's unhealthy. It's very good. Uh, With Series 2, I would say that in a general sense, this is like the sort of template for the kind of series that I really, really like in the show. But because we're sort of at this early stage comparing one series to another... It's kind of it's more sort of a black and white comparison yeah it's very easy for me to not praise it as much as series one but in an isolation if we remove series one out of the picture i really really like it uh, there's a couple of rocky points like there's some bumps in the road but for me there um there's a lot more good than bad and i would happily watch it anytime it's just i think yeah like you said there was a short turnaround and a lot of pressure and a lot of things that were unexpected yeah, which we'll get into, but I still think, Rick, despite the circumstances, at least from for what I enjoy in this show, it still pulled through. I just think that maybe if there was some changes and some a bit more production time, it would be like you know, contending for like up there with series one. Mm. Um, but I still really like it, despite that. Um, but yeah, there are some little niggles. Um, mm. Yeah. So with that said, Jake, yes, um, this is the first series with the tenth Doctor. Yep. Um, so we've now gotten a full series of him. In fact, in terms of episodes, I Not suppose oh, I suppose doesn't really count for Love and Monsters because he wasn't really in that much. But yeah. but technically speaking, you've got slightly more than Eccleston, but. It's around about the same. You've got around about the same amount of episodes as each. So yeah. now you've got like a general idea of, um, I suppose, in a sense of an introduction. Mm-hmm. It's not quite a complete arc, the same way Eagleson's is, but you do have a full series to work with. So, what are your thoughts on the 10th Doctor at this point? Um, I think, well, I think the character has evolved quite well alongside David Tennant's, uh, what he's brought to the role. Mm-hmm. I feel like they have both uh, changed in tandem, you know? So, like, I, th- I think, in a way, they probably wrote the Tenth Doctor in a, in a different way to what it's actually portrayed. And I think that that comes from Dave Tennant's acting and his what he feels comfortable doing. Um, but as a progression from, from Eccleston, it's quite nice to have more energy and more... Uh, you know there's still the serious moments and there's still the slightly melancholic moments Mm. and brooding shit but uh there's a lot more fun yeah with david Tennant. so it it's nice to it's i i don't think i don't like it like him better than the ninth doctor but 
I like him quite a lot. You like the differences? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Adam. I'm very much in the same boat. I think I made it pretty clear throughout that Series 2, I find the Doctor a bit wishy-washy in terms of he's a little bit inconsistent. But that just comes by nature of it being, A, again, the short turnaround, Mm. and B, it being his first season. Because with Eccleston, I think, what, there was two years at least of pre-production. So that was a really fine, finely tuned instrument. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. Mm. Whereas with Tenet, it feels like there was a bit more of a blank canvas. That's what I was um, going to say about series one. It's yeah. like there would have been more pre prod. Exactly. For it. Yeah. That's why it yeah. felt so tight. And also, the other thing is is that um, Davies only had one series commission at the very start. Yeah. So, in his mind, he was writing a character's full story. Yeah. Which is why at the end of The Parting of the Ways, it feels like you've got an entire story with this doctor. Whereas a tenant, when, Sarah, when he was writing series two, he knew that there was more than just one. So, he had quite a bit of breathing room to work with. Yeah. With that said, he didn't need to think about finishing his story quickly because he knew the actor wasn't going to leave either. Yeah. So, I sure. think that there's something to be said about the fact that there is a, a different goal in mind as well as a different production circumstance. For sure, yeah. And and I do like his Doctor. It's David Tennant. He's one of the most charismatic actors around. He's one of my, if not my favourite actor alive. Mm. I adore the man. He's one of my like childhood heroes and whenever I'm performing, I have been told that I often evoke him be it consciously or subconsciously um, just because he was so influential on me as a child in this mm. role um, but no I, I do enjoy his performance but just from a writing and character perspective he's a little bit more inconsistent in this season than Eccleston was in the last season um, but I do enjoy him it's just that I find him harder to sink my teeth into as a protagonist in this season than Eccleston in the last one. Mm. But I do like him a lot. Mm. Yeah, so I the way I see it is um, he's... I would say in probably about half the episodes he's, about, he's as good as Eccleston, if not better, for me. But it's the fact that mainly to do with the fact that his first few don't really introduce him fully mm. because as we said in the reviews the Christmas invasion he doesn't appear until the last 10 minutes in New Earth he's possessed in Tooth and Claw he's Scottish mm. school reunion yes we do get a lot more of the 10th Doctor but the story is focused around Sarah Jane then Girl in the Fireplace um, we do get quite a bit but there's a section where he's drunk it's also fo- there's also a lot of because it's a Moffat story. It's focused a lot on the story itself. There's a lot to build. Mm. Sideman Tupada is about Mickey and Rose, not yeah. him. Um, Idiot Slanton genuinely quite bad. And then it's not really until the Satan Pit Tupada that we get a full story with the Tenth Doctor that's fleshed out and gets an entire view of his character. And the reason why that is is because it was the last one made in the series. Yeah. So we they, that was the only one apart from maybe one or two others, that actually had a really, really decent amount of time to write and prepare for. Yeah. Um, so I think whilst whenever Tennant is on screen, aside from one episode, I really, really enjoy him. I think he's a brilliant actor. And I think he has some absolutely phenomenal moments in this series. I think in um, when we were reviewing the finale two-parter, we really said how much he just absolutely nailed everything about the Doctor. But... As a whole, the front end doesn't introduce him as impactful as you'd want. He's, it's very much a transition in. Mm. And also the fact that there's... Again, like Love and Monsters is a Doctor Light episode in his first series. It's just there's a bunch of hurdles that sort of prevent him from fully unleashing himself. Yeah. Aside from like a few stories. So it's... Yeah, it's an interesting one to talk about. Because I really, really, really do like the Tenth Doctor in this series a lot. But I think that because he's not as featured as Eccleston was in Series 1, it does hold them back a bit. Yeah. Um, but that being said, uh, with with sort of in my mind of his sort of character arc, I really do like this as a beginning point because of the way this series introduces not only his sort of personality on the surface, but also because of the events of the series sort of setting up where his character goes mm. um, which I won't divulge into too deeply because obviously you haven't seen any of that mm. but I think this is a really good starting point it's just I wish maybe he had a bit more screen time in the early stages yep 
like proper screen time, you know? For sure. Um, but like you, Adam, he's one of my favorite actors, and I think that um, that's one of the main reasons why I think it pulls through for me mm. is the fact that regardless of where where the writing possibly is a little bit not giving in the full potential, the actor is so phenomenal. But I can forgive it a lot of the time because mm. I just find him an extremely captivating person to watch on screen. Mm. For sure. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Um, in terms of the cocaine meter for this series, we have a full graph now. Oh, wow. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be bothered to do this or not, but if I am, then that's lucky for you guys. Um, the idea is that I would want to have like a graph on screen with all the like episodes. Um, so, so to put in perspective where he went through in this series, because um, I went back and rewatched all the segments that we decided... Uh, in the mini episode Born Again he was sniffing mm-hmm. uh, then in Christmas Invasion he was also sniffing mm-hmm. New Earth came down to a sober mm-hmm. uh, then Tooth and Claw he went up to a scar face and a half mm-hmm. uh, then School Reunion back down to a sober Girl in the Fireplace on the cocaine scale he was sober but he was drunk on alcohol which is a interesting Bastard. little change then on Rise of the Simon he was sniffing a little bit Age of Steel we said sober and a half because it was kind of halfway between sober and sniffing. Idiot slant and up to Scarface and a half. That was like the most ridiculously energetic he was in the whole series. It was dumb. Uh, then Impossible Planet down to sober. Same with Satan Pit and Love and Monsters. He had a bit of a cool off period after Idiot slant and just recovering from <laughs> that from that disaster. And then with Fear Her, we got a very unique category which is outside the box of this graph, um, where he was completely energetic on the inside but contained within a body that wasn't moving mm. so it was almost like a I don't know what the word it's like a vol- dormant volcano yeah uh, but you can see the lava dripping out the top um, that kind of subverted you a bit didn't it when you saw that a little bit yeah because because uh, you expected it to be like on the same diagonal graph no, I thought he was going to be fucking mental but <laughs> mm. yeah but it was more internal than you thought Ooh. And then Army of Ghosts and Doomsday, we agreed that he was very balanced. He was fully in control yeah. of his... Vices. Vices. And the stakes were too high. And the average we got for Series 2 was 0.9 points, which was just below sniffing. So he was, if you round that up, it's about a sniff on average. And basically from this graph, what we can say is, is that for the, for the most part he was in control, but there were a few points where he really lost it. Mm. Um, whether that be for the better or worse, depending on, I suppose, how entertaining it was. Yeah. Because, for example, if you look at the two scar faces, Tooth and Claw was a scar face and half, and so was Idiot's Lantern. But I really, really enjoy him and Tooth and Claw going insane when he was in the the library. But then you get uh, Idiot's Lantern, where I don't. Mm. So yeah. I suppose it depends on the context of where the energy comes from. Mm. I suppose the writing would make a difference to that. Um, with that said, have we got anything else to say about the Doctor before we move on? No. No? no. Ready to go? Um, so I suppose you just, I, you suppose you just got to look forward to see wh- where this goes from here, right? With the Doctor? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, as, um, uh, the way he's been portrayed the series and where it's sort of ended up, are you interested to see where this leads? Well, yeah, because he doesn't have a companion. Oh, well, you've got Catherine Tate, mm. but well, I, I don't know. But he's know. just lost a companion. Yeah, exactly. So, mm. see if he's got post companion stress. Mm. But you can, considering when he was acting in that scene, you'd imagine that it would probably affect him. Yeah. Um, should we move on to the next character? Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Of course, the main companion of series two is Rose Tyler, who stuck around from series one. Um, Jake, your thoughts on Rose? Um. I, th- I think we covered it in some of the episodes but like you can tell that as a character she's gone from this like puppy dog follow follow the doctor at the toes to um being able to like control and handle situations you know like mm. like she is also a doctor in a way she's much more confident she's like dr rose mm. and he's obviously doctor who but she doesn't have any of the same like power though she's just got the, the no, confidence but yeah. she's got the intelligence you know she's got the she's got the wit she's got the, the brains 
It comes from learning, right? Yeah. That's the idea. Um, yeah, so I think, I think, and also the way she, she was let go as well was really done really well. And um, yeah, I think, I think it was a, a good character development throughout the whole series. Um, and then, especially with the, the Mickey, the Sidemen ones, even though I didn't really enjoy the episodes that much, I still thought that the that whole um, dynamic throughout, throughout that was really good. Um, that comes and circles back into the finale when Mickey returns. Yeah, exactly. Well. And then, um, yeah, and mm. I think her departure was timely and uh, made sense. Mm. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, Adam, it's your time to give your opinion <laughs> okay I agree with Jake that the the, the the evolution of her character in terms of she's more prepared to handle extreme situations and be calm under pressure that's great that's a great progression a stepping stone for the character and it works really well and Billy Piper plays it beautifully what I'm not so much of a fan of is her infatuation with the doctor when it fully become like as opposed to like you know she flirted with Eccleston a little bit the in this dances. yeah in this <laughs> in this it becomes a proper romance and I don't enjoy that angle so much and when that overtakes her being an intelligent or feisty or you know capable character companion when like you know when she gets really competitive with sarah jane though obviously they get over it i don't really like that element of her character and that to me was a little bit of a step down from what we got last season where she's quite naive but she's willing to learn she's willing to put herself in danger even though she has no idea what she's doing and then from that how she became more confident but also it's a double-edged sword for me because on some fronts I like where they took her and other fronts I really don't and we'll get to her farewell once we do the rankings but I have things mm. ha hang-ups on that that I'm not such a fan of mm. that's my opinion on Rose right um, in regards to me this is a this is an interesting one to talk about because I feel like Oh, I'm trying to formulate the words for this because it's not it, someone who, if I was to write down like pros and cons, this character, someone would probably read that and think, "Oh, you must have mixed feelings." It's not really mixed feelings. It's just, oh, I would say, I do really like Rose, but I think there is some inconsistency because you said that um, about the, the Doctor. Yeah. Um, with Rose, I do feel that in the sense that I do appreciate when I look at the singular episodes, right, by themselves, it all makes sense to me, like where what the character's doing and the way they're the way she's acting. But the the part that baffles me is how they connect in between each episode. Because, for example, in an episode like Tooth and Claw. She's extremely friendly, helpful, very positive, very kind-hearted. She's, mm. um, you know, she's very much like she was in series one, but with a bit more confidence, with a bit more, like, humorous elements. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, sometimes she's a bit bratty, but she's very much like a, quite a strong-minded individual. But then, in School Reunion... Obviously, Sarah Jane turns up, which obviously is going to have an impact, but it just... The way she's reacting to Sarah Jane, it feels so different episode yeah. by episode, and it's like, I wish there was just a bit more cohesion in the sense that... Like, because I do... I like I like that she has a rivalry with Sarah Jane, because that makes sense in my mind. It's almost like, you know, if the Doctors were to meet each other, you'd imagine they'd have a rivalry over their own body. Mm. If the companions meet each other, especially those who are so attached to the Doctor, you would imagine there would be a bit of butting heads. And that creates some really comedic moments that I enjoy. But I just think that if there was more cohesion between the episodes in the sense that her getting to that point felt like it was natural within where they were going, because 
it to me feels like each guest writer was given an outline for what Rose was doing in series two and they all took a different path of it because that's naturally what's going to happen when you've got a bunch of different minds with different ideas that read something different but what I sort of put that down to and this is rare because I I'm very I love Russell T but I think that it might as we said may have been due to the short turnaround I feel like them wasn't enough attention put into her consistency within the show's episodes in a straight line uh, in the sense that I wish that Russell T had focused more on having her character feel naturally progressive through all the episodes yeah like she did in series one because in series one she changes quite a lot but it feels natural within the episodes you can see the change happen whereas in series two it's a bit like it, it changes quite rapidly and I don't, I don't necessarily dislike any of the things they do with it, except for one episode. But we get to that. Um, but it's just that the fact that the, that they don't feel connected, mm. that it sort of feels a bit jagged, and that's a, it does bother me a bit. It does. Um, but in terms of as a whole, I think that whilst that certainly does bother me a little bit. I think by the time we get to sort of near the end stages, I tend to it sort of just brushes over, and I, it's because it's more so in the first half that the inconsistency really happens. Yeah. It, but then by the time we get to the end, I, it sort of stops a bit and it like cools off, and then I, I sort of get more. It's around about the Satan Pit two part of that I'm more on board with her again. Yeah, she's great. And it feels more consistent, and then by the end of series two, I'm back. I'm back into it. But I just yeah, I just think that. If I had it, if I had it the way I would ideally have it, I just wish there was a bit more cohesion between the episodes because mm. that's my main sort of problem I have with it, which upsets, ugh, makes me feel a bit wobbly, mm. thinking about it. But um, but but I still like her. I still like Rose, and especially the actress. I think Billy Piper think, yeah. is fucking great. In she this is. Role. She's incredible. Yeah. Um, have we got anything to discuss based on that? Because we all sort of had different things to say. <clears throat> I think I think it's different for me, like obviously coming at it from an older age and you know s- seeing it, it just kind of makes sense for a relationship type thing to form from that. I mean, uh, like it doesn't not make sense that it happens, but I can see why people don't want it to happen because it's you know it's not it's a kid show, I guess. Or it's a sci-fi show. It's it's not so much that. It, it as a concept, I don't... Because I don't necessarily have any aversion to any concept. Yeah. It's just how it's executed to me feels too soap opera-y for its own good. Right. Um, whereas some other elements, more dramatic elements, like Jackie Tyler... I think Jackie Tyler being left on her own in Love and Monsters is more of a convincing drama than their farewell in Doomsday. Okay. That I just I I don't know I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but I just even as a kid, like I was like, oh, it's sad to see her go because she's a fun character, but the romance part of it never clicked with me. Mm. It just it just didn't work. Yeah. But I've I've no uh, aversion to it. You know, people being romantic with the Doctor. Yeah. Because, because you know this show is open to infinite possibilities, so why not explore that? I just feel like I think part of it comes from the fact that I don't buy that the doctor would reciprocate. Right. As opposed to her falling in love with him, I, I do get that. But him reciprocating it, even though he doesn't outright say it, you know, the implication is strong enough to buy that's what they're going for, that's the angle they're taking. Mm. I don't gel with that. Mm. And that's you know, it's it's yeah, there's just not enough there to support it for me to fully buy into it. Fair enough. Mm. And I suppose part of that is also just the way you see the Doctor as a character. Because that's why, I think I said in the Doom series, I was talking about how there's a lot of Classic Who fans that don't like it because obviously in Classic Who the Doctor was asexual, at least was presented asexual yeah. for the entire thing. So for it to now, I suppose, change, a lot of people would maybe not agree with it because... They don't see the Doctor in that way. Mm. Um, it also depends on how much you can uh, accept how the character changes between regeneration as well. Because I've had a conversation recently, and also those of you who have checked out the calendar will know this from day eight. Um, 
there are some people that whilst they're the doctor changes you know traits and look mm. and personality throughout regeneration there are some people that see the doctor as one character that's that has a mild change of like appearance or like attitude mm. but they do see the doctor as like one consistent character whereas there are other people that see all the different doctors as completely different characters there's also nuance in between that there's some people that have it both ways i think i would say i'm sort of i'm sort of in between because there's i do think there is a through line but i also think there are massive differences as well so it really is dependent on how you read the doctor as a character and if you don't see the doctor as a romantic character at all like that's completely off limits you're not going to enjoy it, are you? Because mm. it's just not how you view the character. Yeah, yeah that's fair enough. Um, and like you said, for you, it's more just when you watched it, you didn't buy that that was legitimate. Yeah, yeah exactly. Maybe if it was, if it were Tenant for both seasons, or if it was Eccleston for both seasons, I could buy it more. But because this Doctor, anyway, it's you know, it's it's just it's just a bit too. Uh, sudden for this it's all it's too much implication and so not too, enough too forced yeah there's not there's not enough directness in it in terms of how it is presented within the episodes beyond a couple of scenes of them being quite flirty but the scenes of them being quite flirty I really don't like like in Idiot's Lantern yeah with mm. the Elvis bit and <laughs> I just yeah. you go on my way doll yeah, it just it's pretty. It's, it is yeah. pretty bad. Also, it, ju- it just doesn't. Work, it just doesn't work for me. I get why people do like it, and I'm not going to you know scream and yell at people. No, the doctor shouldn't be in a romance, but the romance just doesn't work for me. See, mm. all right then. Um, but I will. Yeah, I will say that it is quite a unique circumstance, and I think that's kind of the point as well, mm. in the sense that, like you said, um, I think from Rose's point of view, this is a man who's completely changed his the way he looks, the way he dresses, his entire personality on on on, on a snap. Mm. He regenerated halfway be- between her meeting him yeah. and and when she left. It's a very unique situation. It's I think like regardless of how you feel about the execution, I think it's a really unique experiment as well. Yeah. In the sense that you're going to do attempt a romance story where the male changes completely halfway through the the story and also he's an alien that's mm. 900 years old yeah but looks young it's 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 very odd it's nothing that like we've ever seen on tv before at this point maybe there's some slight you know there's some examples that are similar but i feel like this is quite a unique situation and i can imagine why russell t would look at this and think this is something that hasn't been done before. I want to try this because he's he's got big balls. Mm. And he's daring, and I do I do have I do think that there is a level of respect to have for someone who can have that kind of idea of I'm going to do a romance, but I'm going to do it with these really odd circumstances and see if I can pull it off. Yeah. Um. So yeah. It is it is very unique in in, in a sense. Um, should we move on to the next character? Let's do it. Okay, Jake, your thoughts on Mickey Smith? Um, uh, just trying to remember, like throughout most of most of his appearances were in the first half, so it was quite a while ago. For you. Yeah, I remember, like, I did really enjoy him in the Simon thing. I do remember that. Mm. Um. That was when he went in when he met his um, dead grandmother in the Palo universe. Yeah, Jake. Was yeah, yeah. Um, but like before that, I can't really recall. Do you want me to give you a little refresher? Yeah, like what episodes was he in? So Christmas Invasion, obviously he was. I remember he was a mechanic at the start. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, then he basically he's like, "What the fuck? The Doctor looks completely different." Yeah, no, I remember that. Um, and so then was he in new earth no no he wasn't um so so he was in that and um there was a little bit of uh he was sort of he was like oh no i remember i remember the episode and then he was and then he was in school reunion after that I and he like that was the episode where he was being compared to K9. and he's like oh shit i'm the tin dog in this in this tardis team yeah so i i do i do think that mickey was was pretty good in the series in fact i think he was one of my 
favorite characters in the series, to be honest. Um, it's mainly the Sidemen episodes that he stands out. Yeah, I think, and and I think that's the reason why is because, um, it's it's like such a, it's quite a cool character arc in in the way that it, it uh, he goes from being like this compared to a dog, you know, being mm. compared to being useless, mm. and then and then to suddenly having to figure out and fix a whole thing. But then that's also the last we see of him as well. Like like once he hits his peak, he's gone. Mm. Um, then if we see he comes back in the finale and he's a fucking badass. Yeah. Well, but, but then he is scared again. It's kind of, of, yeah. He's, well, he, the thing is with the Cybermen, he was confident. He's like, I've yeah. got this figured out. But then when the Daleks. the Daleks turn up, he's like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, I think it was pretty good in this series. Yeah. Definitely compared to series one, he was less of a, a flop well it's because of his development I would say yep um because we did really enjoy him in series 1 but it was very much formulating when is he when is he gonna when is he gonna snap out of it mm. and then I think um but it's just funny that once he does it's like that's the last episode you see of him yeah. up until up until the finale yeah. yeah um but I think that's that is kind of the point though in the sense that oh, definitely that's, don't ever stay you're welcome yeah once once his once he finally because he's not he's not a main companion he's not a main character so mm. like they can only like because c- if they kept, kept on progressing his story and like kept him in the main thing then he's contending with Rose as a, as, as the next main character and, and I think it's mm. they don't want that contention in the in the story because then you've got to figure in a whole nother character into the plot so I think yeah that's exactly why they would have got rid of him and yeah well, and and like dropped him out because it's like okay he's hit a point in this in his his character arc where people can be satisfied that um he's he's done enough and he's not co- going to contend with, yeah with, uh, also i think characters. the the way that this the side man story is set up it gives a very easy window for him to leave in the sense that it's a parallel universe where his gra- his grandmother's still alive and he has a responsibility because his double was killed and this guy, you know, Jake in the parallel universe was obviously very fond of this guy. And then, you know, Mickey says, you know, I'm not Ricky, but I'm very li- I'm very similar to him. Mm. And I also want to, you know, I want to help out. He, it feels like he gets a big sense of responsibility, which is a big part of him. Because before that point, he, he definitely was sort of, yes, when you look at series one, he was definitely, he, he, you could see he was like goofing around a lot and he sort of lacked a bit of purpose. And, you know, his life was sort of tormenting him a bit in the sense that the only things that he really cared about didn't care about him. You know, I mean, I suppose because, like, you know, the Rose thing was very up and down, wishy-washy, especially when the Doctor entered her life. It made things very complicated. And the thing is, like, Mickey would look at the Doctor and see the great things about him, but also see that the Doctor's taking away the life that he had. Mm. I think he was tr- desperately trying to discover something for him to to sort of have responsibility for, for something for him to do, because he really, you know, he really was struggling in some senses. And I think that Cyberman 2 part really sets up that big change in the sense that he finds his grandmother who's alive in this parallel universe that he dearly misses, and also the fact that he, there is an opportunity for him to do some really quite heroic work with the side men you know and also the torchwood thing it, it all just sort of fell into place for him and i think that for me that's an extremely satisfying end to this character who started out as pizza pizza you know and he was fucking you know running into walls and it, he was always the butt of the joke yeah i think that's for me and also just an old clark is perfect in this role he's so good as his character in the sense that he can pull off the sillier moments but he also once Mickey gets more confident he shows an, a completely different side of his acting range mm. I just love him so much so I really don't have any complaints about him at all I love Mickey a lot what are your thoughts? Mickey has the best arc of all the characters in series 2 he's the one who grows and develops the most from series 1 and his story ends in a satisfying way because he finds a purpose. He's not just wheel spinning anymore because he was sort of the comedic side relief. He was the tin dog, as they very rightly pointed out. And that led to some funny moments in school reunion. 
But then once the Cybermen stories happened, you realize he realized, oh, I have found something to fight for. My grandmother is here. Rose has moved on from me. Rose is out of the picture for me in that sense. And I'm okay with that. I'm at my peace with that. And he becomes a more well-rounded character. So when he shows up in the finales and he's this sort of gun-toting badass, it doesn't feel like a betrayal of the character or, or a sudden turnaround because where he ends in the Age of Steel and the Rise of Cybermen, he has developed, he's found his place and it makes Mickey a really well-rounded character. And it rewards you from having stuck with him from series one to find him in this more satisfying conclusion. And I really, really like that. Mm. And that's my thoughts on Mickey. Yeah. So pretty positive all round. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, just, I've always had a very special place for that character. It might, it might honestly be because it was one of the very, like the first Doctor Who story I ever saw was The Age of Steel and that episode is centered around him. Mm. So I think I do have a very nostalgic connection with Mickey. Um, I've always, he always brings me back to being young. Um, and I just, yeah, th his whole arc in series two, I think, just considering he's only in like a few episodes, I think it really works. Oh, to be young yeah. again. Huh? Oh, to be young again. Yes. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just joking. Once you hit the age of like 21, 22, you start to notice some problems. I'm ripe. I call myself ripe. <laughs> okay. Lucky for some. Yeah, whereas when we were like 18, 19, we were completely Is that reckless. All the characters we've gone through? No, 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 no. Just ignore that. Oh, shit. Just, just ignore that. I was like, holy fuck, I don't remember that <laughs> any fucking characters. Nah, just, just ignore that, Jack. It's fine. Right. Um, Jackie Tyler. Oh, she was, she was pretty on and off in this. In this uh, series, eight. like, she uh, so she was in uh, Christmas Invasion, um, yeah. obviously, and then she appeared in the New Cyber. Earth. Well, no, she appeared at the very start of New yeah. Earth, but she wasn't isn't really in that. She's just like Goodbye Rose. Yeah. yeah. Then she appears in the Cybermen two part in the as a parallel Jackie. Yeah. Uh, and then we get her in Love and Monsters. That's like her most focused episode. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously she appears again in the finale. Yeah. So obviously like she's still pretty much the same there is that that whole in love of monsters that the sadness of of her being alone and you know trying to um fill the void of of fill the, the void rose that rose hey. has left mm -hmm. um and yeah i think but we already knew that like there's nothing there's nothing new about jackie that you sort of you sort of learn in this series well, there's a few things but they're more sort of comedic rather than yeah, yeah. In, in terms of... Well, like a yeah. person, like you don't yeah. really learn yeah. anything new. The, the, yeah, the, the only thing is, the difference between Jackie and Mickey's arcs is Jackie doesn't really change from a personal perspective. Yeah. S circumstances completely changes and she finds... Oh, Pete, yeah. And, Fucking and moves a whole other universe. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So and there's a lovely resolution to her story and a sort of weird sequel to Father's Day. It's kind um, of weird, though, at the same time. Like, it's like... We were talking about it during the review, mm. like, and the morals behind that, and it's like, is that weird? It oh. is weird, but I think it is, from her perspective, it is justified well enough from, weirdly enough, love and monsters. Yeah. And you understand her loneliness, and to find the one person she's loved more than anyone else in the universe, and vice versa from him, except now the version he's found genuinely loves him. Yeah. It's not just a sort of for show. It's it's a genuine down to earth real connection yeah. that he ha probably hasn't felt since the eighties, yeah. and she hasn't felt since the eighties since he died. And so, even though it is a bit fucked, there is a not, there's a sort of warm resolution that's, to that. I mean, I think that's kind of Russ T in a nutshell. Yeah. In the sense that I was talking before about the unique circumstances of the fact that the Doctor looks young but is old and changes halfway through. His, you know, the story with Rose. How oh, that's a bit strange. But then again, it's like this story is the same. It's so odd. Yet somehow it works. It's quite funny how the characters around Rose sort of have the most um, complete arcs, and then her arc is, I wouldn't say the most complete. You know, it's sort of like the one yeah. that's left up. Yeah, she, yeah, she has left more up, left up in the air. Yeah, she has yeah. more screen time. You know. 
Yeah. yeah. But I think but I think that ghost is saying like more screen time is not good for not yeah. as good for completing an arc because you keep having to add yeah, shit. Yeah, and to it, it ends up sort of wheel spinning. Yeah. As opposed to just being like bang bang bang. Well, bang, unless you bang. got the right content for it, like a series one, she was in a lot of story time, but I would say for the most part. Yeah, but you didn't have was, to wrap it. You didn't have to wrap a story up. Well, you didn't have to, but yeah. what I'm saying is, is there was a lot more for them to tell within the episodes in terms of developing yeah. her. Yeah. that would have been that would have been also again going back to like they had more pre prod time. They yes. would have had more time to refine scripts and yeah. refine. And that's, yeah, Port and I think that's like a that. testament to Russell as a showrunner why Mickey and Jackie's stories are so satisfying um, in the way they conclude is even though they don't have that much screen time and there was such a short turnaround, there was still a natural resolution that was well justified. Yeah. And I like that. Mm. Well, the thing is, I think with, with Rose, it's more so like she got her sort of resolution when she, you know... Um, sort of got to stay with the doctor but the the end of the series is more ripping it away from her you know it's more like taking away what that resolution was but then that isn't that just the resolution to the show then it's like like if she stays with the doctor then it's just like well that's exactly but that's done. but but the the point of it is is that she got to a point where she was she was in a position where she was enjoying what she was doing and she finally found that purpose the same way that like Jackie and Mickey did this series and like especially towards the end but she got it earlier however the the sort of twist of that is the sense that the end of series two is ripping that away from her which is very much like a like a heartbreaking end bittersweet because obviously she is reunited with a full family but there's like a there's a uh, there's a double edge to it in the sense that mm. it's very heartbreaking for her um and i think that like we said in the review that's a much more desirable at least for us because we're quite tormented it's a much more desirable uh closure than if it were they got married and had children you know yeah i like especially I, considering the doctor is an alien and not a real 35 year old man you know well, i prefer sometimes when something is left open-ended because like especially with characters that you are attached to because it's sort of lets their story live on in your mind you know yeah. and um especially with like books and stuff you know when like a book has a character or just like a story that you love and then it just it doesn't really end it just sort of stops mm. but it will it can continue going if it, if it wanted to but it just stops at a point where it's like oh we'll just stop here and then whatever you think happens happens you know mm. It's a very Eastern style of writing a story. But it's... No, but it, it, Jake does have a very valid point. I mean, it's like... It's like Captain Jack, for example. Yeah. You mm. know, there could be so much more to tell, but he stopped at the end of Series 1. Yeah. Mm. Just left in that space station, and he's removed. Because if he was there, he would completely change the dynamic of Series 2. Absolutely. And so, it, it, it makes sense. There's more stories to tell, but you don't have to. You don't... Yeah. Mm. And I, I think that is a testament, again, to the... Uh, like. Um, Russell T Davies and stuff when they just know when it's right to just go that's enough that being said yeah that being said to take that point just a little bit further I really really wish there wasn't a farewell on the beach I really wish the last thing we saw of the Rose and the Doctor was, was just, the wall? That, just that beautiful yeah. shot on the wall because it ag- says it all without saying a yeah, word I'd agree I'd agree yeah. like as much as that in scene like sequences fun with like the music and her voiceover and them fucking driving up to norway and the whole bad wolf bay and shit like that like it's all cool i do agree you could just stop at that at the yeah. wall and that would fucking crush people though that's the yeah. that's yeah. the thing and it would have i think like i think that seems really impactful that shot of them at the wall is mm. yeah gorgeous mm. graham harper yeah beautiful <laughs> and then the scene at the beach where it's just you know over the shoulder, over the shoulder, shot, reverse shot. They're very yeah. close. We yeah. said they were very close-up shots, like almost like eyebrow to lip. Yeah. And it's- it would have been like, yeah, that that shot of the wall and then just the doctor just going back into the title. Like, and being well, sad. Walking back to it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And being lost. And again, that sort of open-endedness where it's just like, there's a part of him that's missing, whereas yeah. he almost got closure with Rose on that beach. Which- like the whole, like if season three could be different where it could be like, wait, is Rose going to be in this one? Is Rose going to be this? And then like maybe six years down the line Rose suddenly reappears mm. that would have been cool maybe yeah. if that ever happened mm. that probably did happen I don't know yeah. I haven't watched the rest of Doctor Who yeah the thing is Jake is um, 
Oh, just it's interesting because like obviously with you Adam it's because you don't like the beach scene you're very much like okay this is the, the better for me the better option is the wall it just is the better option right not for me it just is okay <laughs> well there you go then <laughs> but um but then for someone like me who likes both versions of the potential ending it's like I'm very like I, I would either way I would pr- appreciate it and I'm not really sure which one I would it's hard for me to say because like you said like the wall the wall ending would be a massive punch to the gut and it would absolutely work but at the same time it would be more impactful yeah it would be more like a sudden impact but then yeah. at the same time with with the beach scene I don't really feel like the beach scene for me at least undermines the wall scene either and at, at the same time as like an additional end it's almost like um what's the phrase it's like cutting the onions should we be talking about this when we get to this episode? I think, so, sure. I think we'll do that when we yeah, get right, We'll leave that on a cliffhanger. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll wait till doomsday. I just realized we we, 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 we yeah. go for a fucking 20 minutes on this. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we'll leave that. Um, I was I was thinking of touching on Elton Pope, but I don't think we really need to because Love of Monsters was just one episode. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like any any characters that are just one episode, we don't need no, to No, this about. is all about the whole season, I think. Okay. So now, after that, we now get into all the different categories of best and worst of stuff, mm-hmm. like we did last time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, firstly, we're going to talk about the standout villain oh, fuck. of Series 2. So, like we did well, with Series 1, what I did was I read out a list of them, and then we each get to like vote for what our favourite ones were. Mm. Um, and then we sort of decide based on that if, if we can come to a decision. If not, then we don't. We don't. Um, at the same time, you guys watching in the description, and I'll probably pin a comment too for mobile people, um, there will be polls where you can vote for what your favourites are. Um, so join in on the fun. And and also, because we're in the Series 2 recap, once we've done like a decided what we think each our favourite is for each category, um, after each one, I will go back to the polls we did in the Series 1 recap and read out what the results were for that. Cool! Because I think that would be a cool thing okay. to do. So, anyway, the standout villain for Series 2. Here are the options. We have the Robo Santas mm-hmm. uh, from the Christmas Invasion. We have the Sycorax from the Christmas Invasion. We have the Cat People from New Earth. We have the Disease People from New Earth. We have the Bald Ninja Guys from Tooth and Claw. <laughs> we have the Werewolf from Tooth and Claw. We have um, Mr. Finch from School Reunion. Uh, we have the Krillotane from School Reunion. We have the Clockwork Droids from The Girl in the Fireplace. We have John Lumick from Rise of the Cybermen in the Age of Steel. We have the Cybermen uh, from Rise of the Cybermen in the Age of Steel, Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. We have the Wire from The Idiot's Lantern. We have the Beast from The Impossible Planet, The Satan Pit. We have the Ood from The Impossible Planet, The Satan Pit. We have the Hoiks from Love and Monsters. We have Victor Kennedy, a.k.a. the Absorbaloff from Love and Monsters. Um, we have... Like the the dandelion that that took over Chloe Weber from Fear Her, we have the Scribble Monster from Fear Her, <laughs> and of course the Daleks from Doomsday. Does this have to be? Is it more the villain that I enjoyed the most, or is it the villain? That... Well, last time you said that because um... I know what it is, oh. but yeah, because yeah, objectively they're not a good villain, <laughs> but I enjoyed them a lot. Let's say you can vote for whatever you want to, Jake. Okay, cool. So you, if you got an idea in your head, you go first then. Ah, uh, the Sycorax. Sycorax? Yeah, because yeah. they're fucking funny. Yeah, you love the Sycorax, don't you? Oh, shit. Yeah. They got a cool design too. They had a cool design. They were quite funny. And uh, uh, yeah, I just, I just, I'm just down with the Sycorax. <laughs> I don't know, every... Down with the Sycorax? Um, <laughs> 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 I think, yeah... Like the the other ones, sure the beast was cool because it was epic, you know. Daleks and Cybermen, I didn't really like Cybermen, so you know. I guess everyone else would be like, oh fucking Cybermen, were fucking the best fucking villain of this. No, <laughs> I don't agree with any of you. John Lumick was better than the Cybermen. But how will you do that from beyond the grave? <laughs> um, no, nah, Sycorax for me. Yeah. What about? Okay, hang on. I'm gonna. I'll wait a second. What's your? Do you have a choice? Clockwork. Clockwork droids from Clockwork Gilded droids Fighters. by far. Very scary, aren't they? I fucking love them. Mm. Genius. Moffat is a genius when it comes to creating monsters. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Clockwork. I've got another option. Yeah. I've gone for the Ood. 
Oh. The Ood. I love the Ood. They're not really a villain, in a sense, but I love the design. I love the fact that they are slaves, um, yet that is how they survive. If they're not, if they don't slave around, then they die off. That is an extremely fucked up idea. Um, they're very charming and just, yeah, it's, for me, it's one of the best creations that New Who's made. Is it a group of Ood or a herd of Ood? Probably a, a murder of Ood. A, a murder flock. of Ood. A flock. A, 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 I don't know. Anyway, we've we've all got conglomeration different conglomeration of we, We've all got different answers, so yeah. I suppose it's up to the audience to decide. Yeah. Um Yeah. But I think there was a nice variety of villains. For sure. There were some great villains this season. Oh like, absolutely. Even, even like in episodes I didn't really enjoy, like I think the Scribble Monster is genius. <laughs> uh, it's so dumb, but it's wonderful. Um yeah. and the the absorbaloff. The absorbaloff and though I don't really like the episode, the absorbaloff is a Really gross and creative. And Victor idea. Kennedy. And Victor Kennedy's great, and Peter Kay's wonderful. Big Zima. Um, <laughs> but no, I just think the Clockwork Droids, for me personally, I just really, yeah. really I mean, enjoy it was, the way it wasn't like It wasn't the U by far. Like, I do love the Clockwork Droids, love the Cybermen, and the Daleks, and John Lumick, mm. and the Absorbaloff. I don't think there was a and villain. And the I don't think there was a villain, at least in concept, that I didn't like. The Wire, I feel like, could have been done better, but the Ooh. concept... Ooh, yeah. The concept was great, but it was yeah. too cartoonish, I think. Yeah. Didn't quite work. But weirdly, like, you could argue that Absorbaloff's cartoonish, but that, for me, that's more, like, that's more, like, cheeky, whereas yeah. The Wire feels more like a legitimately 1950s cartoon. Yeah. Anyway, you, know? you, you lot, go on the straw poll. And... Anyway, now we have the results from Series 1, and the standout villain was the Daleks. Well, that just makes sense, they doesn't got, it? They got 53%, and second was the Empty Children, who got yeah. 36 and then everyone else was way behind them. Um... I mean, I don't think there's any surprises there, really. Yeah, but the Daleks won that yep. won that one. Okay, so yeah, go vote in the description what you think your standout villain is for Series 2, and if we get to the Series 3 re recap, we'll read up that one. Um, standout side character. There's, there's like 36 options for this. Oh, God. So you've got quite a lot to work Boost with. Boost through them. Harriet Jones. Dandy Llewellyn. Do, sorry, Danny Llewellyn. Don't even know who that is. Oh, I think he's Llewellyn. one of he's oh. one of the... Side characters in Christmas Invasion. He's one of the unit members. Oh, I can't remember. Um, who Cassandra. Is. I remember it was a pig. Hang on. I choose pig. Hang on. Wait, what? <laughs> Wasn't there a pig in Christmas? No, that Invasion? was the one. That was Aliens of London. That was oh. series one. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, um, Cassandra, um, who was in New Earth. Uh, Chip was also in New Earth. The 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 guy with the <laughs> dude lotter's face. Mm. Um, the flamboyant performance. The face of Bo, who made a very quick appearance and then left and teleported away. Queen Victoria from Tooth and Claw, Lady Isabel from Tooth and Claw, Sir Robert from Tooth and Claw, uh, Captain Reynolds from Tooth and Claw, Sarah Jane Smith from School Reunion, K9 from School Reunion, Madame de Pompadour from The Girl in the Fireplace, Pete Tyler, uh, Jake Simmons, uh, Rita Ann, Ricky Smith, uh, and then we got Magpie from The Idiot's Lantern, The Connolly Family from Idiot's Lantern. I am talking. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, I believe, was at its Lantern as well. Zachary Clock Cross Flane from Impossible Planet, Eda Scott, Toby Zed, Danny Bartok, Scooty Manister, all from Impossible Planet, Satan Pit. Then you got Ursula Blake, Mr. Skinner, Bridget, and Bliss from Love and Monsters. Uh, Mrs. Crute, Trish, Maeve, and Tom's dad, and I think Kel from Fear Her. Uh, Yvonne Hartman from Army of Ghosts and Doomsday, uh, Rajesh, Rajesh Singh from Army of Ghosts and Doomsday, and Adewale and Gareth from Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Can I choose one that's not on that list? Why? Because I like him. Well, can you tell me what it is? It's the um, council worker from Fear Her. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, sweet. That's Excellent. my choice. He's like, he's this season's equivalent to Mr. Sneed, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he's great. He's a council boss, council <laughs> van, there's a council mining axe, and a council road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, he's my favourite side character. He was fucking great, eh? <laughs> uh, Madame de Pompadour. Okay. Oh, she, yeah, she, she, was really good. she was so fleshed out. She was Her story was genuinely touching. It's a romance that I bought. Um, and I in loved, contrast. In contrast, yeah. Um, and I just... I, I love that episode. I love the way she's presented. She's beautifully acted. And it's great. Mm. Madame de Pompadour. I was tempted by that. Ah. <laughs> I was tempted by that. 
I have to say, Madame Poop. Yeah, I got yeah. I was tempted by that. I was also tempted by Toby Zed, mm. who gets taken over from the the Beast. Yeah. Um, I was also tempted by Yvonne Hartman as well. I really mm. like her. Oh um, yeah. But my choice. Oh, actually, no. I was also tempted by Pete Tyler, but I don't think I think series one was more when I because that's what I think I did. I choose him for that one. Oh, no, I didn't because we yeah. can, we counted him as a companion in that one. Yeah. We chose Harriet Jones as series one. I'm gonna go with Sarah Jane Smith. Fair enough. Lame. It's a pretty easy option, but <laughs> I've gone for Sarah Jane. Ragging Smith. on the Cybermen, ragging on Sarah Jane. But you liked Sarah Jane. I did. Like her. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's it, just she's not Madame de Pompadour. It's an easy choice because obviously you know she's got history with Classic Who. Yeah. I'm very connected to that character. I can't not say Sarah Jane. No, I still choose the council worker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It made me laugh, so it's yeah. fine. Yeah. I love Sarah Jane deeply, but Madame de Pompadour for me just in her sing in her singular story this season, I just prefer the character of Madame de Pompadour she, she did get she did get a full arc from her childhood to her death exactly that's so I, pretty impressive so I just her. I just prefer Madame de Pompadour's yeah. story that, though of course she, she doesn't hold a candle just, to Sarah Jane I'm, when she was a companion in the classic oh yeah, series but. I know that I'm just I'm, this this vote comes with heavy bias I'm yeah. sure you realise so yeah I mean, that episode Go on Fireplace is just fucking sublime absolutely it was, it it was. was. but we won't spoil that yeah um, go vote in the comments what your stand outside character was. Maybe it was um, maybe it was Adelweyla and Gareth from Army of Ghosts when they had their little <laughs> in the in the restricted area, and then they got the Cybermen. Come on, Mr. Sneed. Get with it, Mr. Sneed. Is oh, standout music track, Murray Gold. There are eight options for this. Oh. Yeah, I already know what it is. Just wait a second. There are eight options for this. We mm. have Unit. From the Christmas Invasion, we have Tooth and Claw from Tooth and Claw. Mm -hmm. We have the Scasis Paradigm from School Reunion. We have Madame de Pompadour from The Girl in the Fireplace. We have the Cyberman from Rise of the Cybermen and also Army Ghosts. We have the Impossible Planet from The Impossible Planet Satan Pit. We have the sort of, I, I, it was an unreleased theme, I called it Ghostbusters slash Torchwood from mm -hmm. Army of Ghosts. Yep. And of course, Doomsday from Doomsday. Yeah, it's Doomsday. There you go. Yeah. And your reasoning? Oh, it's just really fucking good, isn't it? I've actually listened to it again mm. since, yeah. since we watched it. We discussed in the trivia about how um, the reason why the soundtrack exists is because of that track and the fans wanting the... Yeah. 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 You said you loved the fact that it has a... It's just a song. It's not just a soundtrack. It's a song as mm. well. So Yeah, but you yeah. said you love the fact that it has the mel melancholy emotional sound, yet it still has a beat at the same time, which yeah, is very it's unique. Got, it's got backbeat. Yeah, it, well, it's just unique for, for, for like... Um, a score to have like such a 4-4 four, four, four backbeat you know mm -hmm. just like a boom, boom 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 and it has a violin section as well it's got some violin oh beautiful and yeah. also we discussed how it um, perfectly encapsulates the moment that yeah. it's in in the episode as well so yeah and also how it connects to other themes of her before yeah I think I think just like as a piece of music it's it's the most memorable from right from the series I think you have a different option, don't you? Because I've heard you talk about this before. I think I know what it is. Madame de Pompadour Suite. There we go. I knew it's it. It's one of my favourite pieces of Murray Gold's music. It's really simple. To be fair, I can't remember that. Yeah. I can't it's, remember. It's really, really simple. It's a song that plays um, in her sort of death yeah. scene. It's, it's, no. it's like, I think it's played on um, harpsichord, maybe? Um... But it's like a twinkly piano sound. Um, I'll have to listen to it again. Yeah, it's it's re it's really quite simple. It's like a lullaby almost. Yeah. But yeah. in terms of the structure you of the song... You want to listen to it again right now. No? The structure yeah. of the song and, and the whole suite for the whole episode, but specifically Madame de Pompadour's theme, the way it ties into her character and the way it conveys the feeling of 
love, excitement, and loss all in one simple little melody. Mm. It just, it's the one that, in, it's the only song in this whole series, not the whole series, this season, I mean, season two, series two, rather. It's the only one that genuinely brings emotion out of me. Because the Cybermen theme is fun and I love it and it has great, like, nostalgic value for me. But in terms of listening to it on its own right and making me feel something, Madame de Pompadour Suite is just far and away the best for me. Right. Um, I was very tempted by... I, I actually listened to all eight of these last night because um, I think the music for Series 2, there's a lot of great stuff. It's there is, very sure. consistent. Um, especially considering that this uh, this series, Murray Gold had more to work with in the sense that they gave him a massive orchestra to play with, which really Jeez, amp- nice. ampl- amplifies the sound and make it a lot feel a lot bigger. Mm. Though I do love the more techno sound of the Series 1 score, as we did when we listened to the... Mm. Bad Wolf Pining Away Sweet, sweet During mm. Satan Pit. That's one of my favorites. But in terms of Series 2, I was very tempted by Madame de Pompadour. It's a beautiful piece of music. I was also tempted by <coughs> the Impossible Planet theme as well. Yeah. Uh, the old sound with the almost funeral-esque tone to it, yet it feels alien as well. But I'm going to have to go with Doomsday. It's just... It's one of those songs that I've it's stuck with me since I first watched the episode, since I was a kid. It's very memorable. It's got all the things that I love about Murray Gold's music. It's kind of like, for me, it's sort of a signature track in a way. It's got the female vocalist. It has the the, the soft bass. It has a piano. It has an electric guitar. It has an acoustic guitar and it has a violin. Yet it doesn't, it's not a mess. It's not all over the place. It's perfectly paced. It's perfectly executed. It's so soft and impactful. It's very, oh, it's so, mm just makes me feel warm inside very good song uh, i've listened to it hundreds and hundreds of times um but madame de pompadour was very close very close i do love that one too um so yeah go over it in the comments i'll be very interested to see the results of this because i'm there's so many tracks that people love from yeah. this that are very close yeah like i'm sure the sideman theme is probably going to get quite a few votes too mm. <laughs> mm. i will actually <laughs> the I, I will I will actually add on top of that as well. Um, I, re- I remember I said during the Age of Steel review and also the finale review about how I loved the way Murray Gold uh, threaded through different versions of the Sideman theme in the sense that sometimes it was much lower and he did it on piano. It was very cool yeah. how they did that. You were reusing the light motif to convey the idea. Yeah, it yeah. was great. A musical motif. Mm-hmm. So the results for series one... Um, the Doctor's theme slash Bad Wolf theme got 37%. Yep. That yeah. was number one. Followed that by that was the Daleks, yeah. um, which was very close. That was 19%. Then you had Rose's theme, which was 16%. Father's Day, which was 12%. That was my choice. I think I chose Father's Day too. No, you didn't. Yeah. You chose the Lone Dalek. Did I? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but that's a gorgeous And piece you chose the Daleks. Yeah. Um, Westminster Bridge got 5%. The Lone Dalek got 5%. Uh, and everything else got like one vote, if it got any... But the doctor's Jeez, theme got yes. the doctor's theme got the most. That was my first choice, but then I chose Father's Day instead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, series one's great. Um, anyway, but yeah, I think overall, just Murray Gold is outstanding. There, there is one. Obviously, we did discuss the Idiot's Lantern. The episode, the music that played at the end of that was not good. The weird, fluffy acoustic guitar track. It was very off-putting. But apart from that, I thought he was very good in mm. this series. For sure. Just really brings out the... He's a genius. Yeah, he's a genius. Okay, standout classic Who clip. Uh, we have 15 of these because obviously we watched one in Born Again, so the 14 episodes plus that. Uh, we had No Doctor, I'm the Doctor from Robot. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had The Doctor and the Dandelion from Robot. We had Ace Hunted by the Cheetah People from Survival. Uh, we had Fear and Loathing in Perivale from Ghostlight. We had Sarah Jane Leaves from The Hand of Fear. We had The Doctors Trapped in a Burning Building from The Reign of Terror. We had Falling into a Parallel Universe from Inferno. Is that the one where he's in the army base? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we had The Cybermen Break Out of the Tomb from Tomb of the Cybermen. Yeah. We had The Doctor is Ridiculed from An Earthly Child. We had the When Robots Go Bad from The Robots of Death. We had Sutek from Pyramids of Mars. We had... Oh. The Doctor gives a blowjob from Creature from the Pet. Uh, we had The Doctor Strangles Perry from The Twin Dilemma. 
We had the Daleks return from the Dalek invasion of Earth, and we had Goodbye Susan from the Dalek invasion of Earth. Ooh, um, see, I'm tossing up between Doctor Falls into the parallel universe and Sutek. Yeah, oh, it's kind of a little bit of a difficult choice, to be honest. Because I really like the, I really liked him like creeping around in the in the army base, and then Liz. Yeah, and then they she finds him, but she's not. She's a parallel. She has no idea. Doesn't he put is. like a Russian hat on at some point as well? Nah. Oh, no. I don't know why that no, was. Don't know why that was in my brain. No. <laughs> um, he gets taken inside UNA and like <clears throat> all the people he know are evil. Yeah, like, yeah. Brigadier is brigade leader, and he's yeah. got like an eye patch. I think. Um, I think I'm gonna choose that one because it stuck with me the most. Mm. Like, like that was the first one that I thought of when we when we went through that. But mm. very close second comes to Sutek because it's just cool. I am Sutek. Where I try to leave dust and darkness. Yeah. And then he burns his servant. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And just like the effects of him coming out of the mm. out of the tomb. That's yeah. Cool. This one's a hard one for me actually. There's a lot in here that I love. Do you have one yep. in mind? I think I know which one yours is. Sarah Jane fucks off in the hand of fear. I said that really coarsely, but it's actually a really affecting scene. The way it's she means so much to the doctor, but it's such a simple farewell. Just mm. mm-hmm. And she, they just don't say goodbye. And I think that's far more powerful than Rose Tyler I. That was really forced. That was really pedestrian. You yeah. know? Like, it was like... Uh, yeah. yeah. Whereas, whereas the Sarah Jane and the Doctor not physically unable to say goodbye to each other because of how much their friendship means to one another, I find so powerful, so touching. It's the best, in my opinion, of those clips. Yeah. Though there are some belters in that one. Oh yeah. Um some fucking belters. Yeah. God, this is hard. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I've narrowed it down to like two or three. Shit. Ah, uh, I'm gonna say it's either the Cybermen Break Out of the Tomb or Goodbye Susan. Oh dear. This <laughs> That's not easy to choose because they're both very different scenes. But we have no ties on this channel. Yeah, we don't. We don't have any ties. Um. Okay, I love the Simon Breaker of the Tomb, it's but I'm great. but I'm gonna go with Goodbye Susan. The reason why is that it has a direct impact on the Doctor as a character in terms of his his whole story. Yeah. Um, whereas the Simon Breaker of the Tomb is fucking great, but it's contained to that one story. Yeah. Definitely. Um, it's memorable, but I think Goodbye Susan, especially for the first Doctor, it really, it's re- really powerful for me. Yeah. Um, sure. Just the way William Hartnell paces his sentences, mm. it just re- oh, fucking, mmm, mmm, it's good. So we've all picked different ones again. Yeah. Uh, vote in the comments what your favourite is. Uh, so let's see what the series one one was. I think I know what it was. I think I've seen these polls before. I think I've got a feeling. I don't know which, what it's going to be. So let's see. Yep, it is. It's the Autons Invade from Spearhead from Space. Mm. That was the first one we did. Um, and then the second is which box is bigger from the Robots of Death. That was one you chose. Yeah. Um, that's got 14%. There's a lot actually that have quite a lot of votes. Like it's very across the board. You know, you've got Can't Write re History from the Aztecs. You've got Allies are different from anybody else's from Tomb of the Sidemen. I picked that one. Uh, first time inside the TARDIS from an unearthly child. You got the Doctor escapes an acid bath from Vengeance of Varos. <laughs> the first Doctor yeah. regenerates from the Tenth Planet. The ripple effect from Movements of the Daleks. There's a lot. There's a bunch. Did of anyone vote for the T one? That was the ripple effect. The ripple effect. I don't like that. Why? Because it was such fucking stupid resolution to yeah, that, that clip two nothing, sugars. That clip has nothing to do with it. Wait, clip. which which one's the one with two sugars? Dalek. The episode itself ha- reveals that he has two hearts. Ah, uh, fuck. But the one where he drinks the tea. That started the whole. That started the whole. F- the the whole fucking. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, it's some bullshit. <laughs> it's not though. It's two hearts. Maybe he just likes two sugars in his tea. No, he has two hearts. I like two sugars in my tea sometimes. Okay, do you I've have, got a single okay. heart. If if the doctor had your personality, he would have four sugars in his tea. 
That makes no sense. It doesn't. It means he has the double amount of sugar because he has two hearts. Let's move on. He has Shug double. He has double. Sugar, sugar doesn't affect your heart. Yes, it does. It affects your brain. It affects your heart too. Yeah. It affects your blood. What? Yes, no. It does. It just releases dopamine in your brain. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> it's not into semantics. <laughs> uh dear. Anyway, um. Standout worst thing in series two. Now I want to preface this like I did in the last time. These suggestions that I have here aren't necessarily my own. Um, I have put down suggestions that people have that I've heard. Um, there are some of these in here that I will I do somewhat agree with to an extent, but I have put them down here because I wanted to get a full spectrum. With um, series one, we all voted for Adam Mitchell by far. Like it wasn't even close. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what the audience has to say yes. about that one. So here are the suggestions. Uh, just about everything in New Earth. Just about everything in The Idiot's Lantern. Just about everything in Love and Monsters. Just about everything in Fear Her. Uh, Rose becoming a jealous, attached, and unlikable person. Sarah Jane's character being retconned as a pining ex-girlfriend. The controversial revival and treatment of the Cybermen the characterization of the Tenth Doctor, and the Doctor and Rose Tyler falling in love. There you go, Slanton. Idiot Slanton. <laughs> <laughs> you like the relationship just a little bit more, don't you? He doesn't hate it as much. <laughs> Part of, part of my beef with the idiot's lantern is the relationship. Oh. <laughs> but for most of it, they're separate, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to have to agree, because I don't think any of the others I really agree with. No, because I think there's, Look, there's some high highs in New Earth. Did I give the idiot's lantern 0 out of 10? You gave it a 1.5. Yeah, it's fucking shit. Nah, actually. It's not... It's, not good. You said it had some neat ideas and there were some little small highlights, but overall you really didn't like it. Mm. Anyway, we'll get back to the Idiot's Lantern. Let's leave that. Um, so we've all decided that it is the Idiot's Lantern that is the worst part, but you guys in the comments can vote for what you think the worst part is. Let's see what they voted for, for Series 1, and see if it is Adam Mitchell, the same that we said. Let's see. I've got a funny feeling it might not be. Mm. It is, 60%, but the farting aliens got 29%. Wow. Um, and the CGI and effects was very small amount after that. But Adam Mitchell did get the most votes, so we're all in agreement on that, which is good. Um, standout thumbnail. I haven't really released all of them yet, have I? I've only done up to Idiot's Lantern. Yeah. Um, from what I remember, let's see, Christmas Invasion, we were all Christmas hugging. Invasion. We're all we hugging, just... we're all, no, I, oh, you want to look at them? Yeah, I'll let's like just, it. let's just, let's just pull up the playlist. Sure, I can, oh yeah, all right then. Because <laughs> we can just all look at it on here. Yeah. Um, for you guys at home watching, you guys will have the options of voting for the, apart from the patrons who won't have the option, but those who are watching this publicly will have the option to vote for, well, at least you'll have the incentive to have the options for the last six episodes. I'll 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 take All it from right, here. Alright, okay. I can avoid Just find series two. Alright, so born again we're all below David Tennant. Um no oh, you can zoom in, yeah. Uh, Christmas Invasion, we're all hugging David Tennant. Uh, New Earth, Adam's the face of Bo, you're David Tennant and I'm the cat. Um, Tooth and Claw, we're all shooting guns and laughing. A school reunion, you're K9, he's the doctor and I'm Sarah Jane. Girl in the fireplace, we're being attacked by the clockwork droids and you're eating a sandwich whilst being attacked. Rise of the Cybermen, you've got your heads in the hand of a Cyberman, and I am a Cyberman. Same thing with Age of Steel, we're all Cybermen. And then Idiot's Lantern, you're on the screen and we're on the screens as well. That's... I think Idiot's Lantern is my favourite. Idiot's Lantern is the best use of the actual context of the episode. Oh, I think, I think, yeah, I think you're right, but I also quite like... Um, this one. School reunion. We yeah. are K9. <laughs> but I think it's Idiot's Lantern. My vote goes to Idiot's Lantern. Yeah. yeah. I'm proud of that one because I actually quite, put a, quite a bit of effort into making our faces look like it's on the screen. Yeah. yeah. With like the colours and everything. It's got the most production value. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. So, um. Uh, but yeah, the vote in the comments, what you guys think is the best one. I, I'm, it's my challenge now to create one better in the next six. <laughs> uh, if that's even possible, but we'll see. Um, it, is, it is actually possible. I've got one in my mind. Um, for series one, Doctor Dance is won by a landslide. That's the one where I'm the bomb and you're Captain Jack. <laughs> That's fucking great. Yeah. 
Um, we also, um, you said you quite like World War Three when we're all the Slovene and our faces are all fucked up. Yeah. I quite like the long game where I'm Adam and you're the you're the nurse. Yeah. Um, but funnily enough, the second place on the voting was Father's Day, where you're wearing the goggles and I'm and I'm there as well. Was that when I had scuba yeah, goggles? Yeah, scuba goggles. <laughs> well, it's probably just because I yeah, had scuba goggles. Long game got three votes. Empty child got three votes. Bad wolf. Got, oh, yeah, empty child was when I'm surrounding you and you look scared. <laughs> Uh, Bear Wolf got three votes. We'll be Captain Jack's biceps. Uh, Parting the Way's got two. Where we're just sort of there. I think they just like that one because the background looks cool on that. Mm. Um, but yeah, Doctor Dancers wins by a landslide. No surprise. Mm-hmm. It's it's iconic. Yeah. I I'll never forget the story I told where I kept on trying to fit my face on the Captain Jack, and I realized that my face was meant for the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, all right. It's now in time for. The episode ranking. Now, the way we're going to do this is the same as last time. Sometimes when me and Adam do these snappity, snappity ranking things, we tend to be a bit looser and we sort of bounce back and forth. But because of the format of this review and the fact that Jake is fresh on this show, the way we do it is we always have Jake start at each line. So what happens is is that Jake's... Because obviously there's 14 episodes this time. There's 13 plus the Christmas special. Um, We've ranked them from our least favorite to favorite each. We don't know what each other's lists are. Um, what Jake's going to do is he's going to read out his number 14 and if either of us agree with him we snap and we talk about it together if not then we wait for him to talk about his and then we read out ours and then once all our 14s are done we start back at Jake again with this 13 vice versa all the way up to 1 Yep. Yep. Um, and I remember the series 1 ranking was a very fun time and we realized some quite interesting things about you and so did the audience and (laughs) i think these rankings are always like the most fun parts of these reviews because it's like it's just it's just fun to have to do this and just see where things land and see where we can be be surprised Mm. and also it gives us a chance to give a final wrap up on what we think of all these episodes yep um, before we move on to the next series so jake what is your number 14? Well, I'm sure it's all yours as well, but it's the Idiot's Lantern. Snap! Snap. I mean, let's be honest. It's it's the the weakest episode I've watched so far mm. of, of Doctor Who. Um, just, yeah, just not very good in any way. Um, if I, I said there was redeeming qualities, I was probably just so nice. So the concept of the... TV taking away their faces. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I guess the concept's kind of cool and stuff, but just the execution, I think, throughout the whole episode uh, just fell through. Every, and every single crack just mm. opened up and yeah. was it, a sinkhole. It basically. just... Yeah, sorry. You finish your point. No, yeah, yeah. So. It was just... Yeah, it was uh, messy. It was just so messy and there wasn't enough to make it sort of an enjoyable kind of messy where you could sort of look through the cracks. It was yeah. just... There was so, there was so many flaws up front and not enough behind it to see past that and I just found it sort of an unpleasant viewing experience um, yeah it's it's a shame because it's as you said some cool ideas and stuff but I just it doesn't really work for me yeah mm. so yeah the um, the main obviously we've gone through the fact that it's very over the top it's very rushed the Dutch angles make you feel dizzy and tilted and mm. sick it's not the, um, right use the family dynamic with the father being abusive was trying to invoke the post-war era but it was done in a cartoonish episode, so it felt caricatured and didn't. Yeah. It fell flat. But to differentiate from other stuff in the series, the main reason I put it at the bottom is because of how it characterizes the Doctor and Rose Tyler. Mm. I think it badly mishandles what Russell T Davies wanted from this series. I think Mark Gatiss, with his whole idea of making this episode feel fifties and cartoonish didn't factor in the fact that this is still a TV series with real characters and real environments with real consequences Mm -hmm. and envisioned them in the sense of, oh, what if I made the Doctor and Rose a 1950s romantic couple? And for me, it just doesn't work. It makes the Doctor feel surface level and annoying. He's got lines like, hell of a right hook! And fucking, there's a bunch of stuff he says... And I'm not listening! Ah. And, you know, David Tennant, I will give credit to his acting. He's very energetic. I was never not engaged with him because mm. I love David Tennant. I love watching him. But the way he's characterized is so offbeat for his character and so outside of what I want that I still can't say I enjoy it. It's yeah. the one episode 
where I don't enjoy the 10th Doctor because of the way he's characterized and Rose is very annoying. You know, there's a scene where she talks about the Union jet flag or Jack being upside down and it's actually not upside down. She was wrong. Mm. It's funny. And then, yeah, she it's very, ugh, it's off-putting and forced and rushed and over the top and the elements that Mark Gaines wanted to splice together into this episode just don't mesh and I wish it was ironed out and thought through. Yep. Um, but you know what? There's some stuff about this episode I like and, you know, there's things that I remember and there's certain little moments that I think are neat but overall it just doesn't work. I um, agree. Yeah. So it is, funnily enough, this is actually quite rare because most people don't have this at the bottom. In fact, most people don't even have this, like, in the bottom two either it's interesting but um i think that really goes to show that the three of us have a very particular taste at least in television maybe doctor who that is different to what most people think mm. so yeah we all put idiot slanting at the bottom there we go then yes, yes, triple yes, yes. trippity snappity snap yes. jake what is your number 13 my number 13 is my number 13 is new earth wait No. Nope. Um, now, granted, I watched this a long time ago, um, but I particularly just don't remember enjoying it. I remember like it being kind of. I think the production value was kind of what got to me the most. So you said one of the biggest problems was the geography, and also the the tone of whiplash. That's right. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was just very disorientating, and. Uh, Although I did like the face of Bo in it, I remember that. Um, yeah. I think it was also one of the more forgettable episodes. Which is um, saying a lot considering it's the series opener. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I remember saying that as well in the review as well. I think I remember saying this is quite a forgettable episode. It kind of felt like filler still. Yeah. Mm. As, and I remember, I think like the first few episodes felt like filler in a way. Well, we got Tooth and Claw, but... I remember we... Um, we had a discussion about this in the sense that I was talking about how obviously it's not I believe we talk about New Earth not being like as strong of an opener as something like Rose is yeah. but we discussed the fact that you were kind of in that post finale hangover and you were recuperating to the point of I have to remember that most episodes aren't at that level yeah in the sense that there's a build to it but still it's still not a very good opener absolutely anyway. not no yeah. it feels like middle of the season yeah mm. okay um yeah. Oh, and also you really didn't like the ADR or the green screen or the CGI. Yeah, that's... The design as well, the, the hospital on the beach side. Yeah, that I'm, I remember not. Just yeah. not really like... Yeah. In general. Uh, does that mean it's my turn because it's horizontal or... Sure. I don't it's mind. Up, you can... Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, considering this, the, the line we're in, I think it's probably yeah, easier if we do it that way. Go for gold. My number 13 is Fear Her. It's not yours? Nope. Oh, wow. Okay. So this, interestingly, when we watched it, was actually quite um, a pleasant surprise for us. In the sense that, well, at least for me, because Fear Her is one of the least popular episodes of Doctor Who ever made. It's extremely hated, and it's on the bottom of DWM for New Who, it's second bottom ever. Um, and I remember really not liking it before, but then we watched it, and I was like, oh, there's actually some really funny improvised comedy in this. Um, and whilst the you know there's a lot of stuff in it that I don't like, like the father drawing the some of the like more sharper turns and tone, like it when it goes from like cheeky to almost Disney ending, um, and there's some really silly bits and pieces. Um, as I like sort of just sit down and watch this little thing happen episode, it's actually quite enjoyable in the sense it's yeah. very surface level, but you know you got stuff like the council worker. It's very meme worthy, is the I word I'd use. I, yeah, I think I think it's one of those things where it's like. You've got to just sort of just be like, well, this story's shit. I might as well just laugh at mm. what's happening. Yeah, you know? and I think my hatred for it has actually softened on our last viewing in the sense that I don't, I don't heavily dislike this anymore. I, in fact, whilst I'm not a big fan of the some parts of it, I actually would sit down and watch it again. Like it's fine. Like, it's very meme worthy, and I enjoy. And big difference from Idiot's Lantern is I actually enjoy the Doctor and Rose, despite the fact that they're very obviously surface level. I actually enjoy them in this episode rather than yeah. Idiot's Lantern where I don't. 
Um, and like we said, comparatively, whilst Fear Her and Edit Slanton are very similar in terms of their location and their structure and their importance, because they're both filler, um, this one is far more improvised and friendly, whereas Edit Slanton is very forced down your throat. Yeah. Which is why I like Fear Her more. It's very, mu- it's very creative. It's charming and low budget, and it's got some fun moments. But um, yeah, it's still not a very good episode. But I would say it's not my least favorite anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It was just a nice little surprise to watch it again and not hate it. I was like, wow, okay. Hmm, that's nice. Anyway, I'm interested to hear what this is, Adam. What's your number 13? It's Love and Monsters. It's Love and Monsters. <laughs> Even though you gave it a 6.5. Yeah. Because I'll get into it with New Earth and Fear Her, which I think are worse episodes. But the reason I put Love and Monsters lower is I just can't rewatch it. I just, I, I tried the other day. I put it on, I was like, okay, let me, for the, for the sake of this, I was like, okay, let me just give it another rewatch. And I couldn't. I was just restless and I was like, nah, I can't, I just cannot sit through Love and Monsters. Hmm. Just. That's unique in the sense yeah. that you gave it some praise in the review, but you were like, but in, from a personal point of view, you've struggled to actually put it on. Yeah, I just... I think objectively from a structure and, uh, and a writing standpoint, it's probably a more fluid and s- more well-structured episode than some of the others on this list, but I just can't sit through it. So that's why um, Love and Monsters is my 13. Okay, then. What is your number 12, Jake? It says Fear Her. Mm. Mm. Number 12? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh my goodness, Adam! What has happened? <laughs> yeah, something's changed. Something has my changed. My twelve, my twelve. Yeah, Fear Her was again everything you said about Fear Her is exactly how I feel about Fear Her. Mm. Um, and I don't really want to, you know, repeat everything, but um, I think it is above um, New Earth for me because there are those enjoyable comedic relief moments, and um, there are some cool ideas yeah and there as like, well uh be- kids being trapped in a drawing and the scribble yeah. and the scribble monster yeah like this and like a fucking massive pod of things flying through space yeah and, and they have they they like feed off empathy oh i forgot to mention as well the scene where the doctor carries the olympic torch yeah <laughs> but but yeah i think there's just more redeeming qualities to that episode than there is to new earth it's just not very like it's just not a very good story at the end of the day, though. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, is it time for my number 12? Yep. My number 12 is New Earth, an episode I don't dislike. I gave it a 6.5 asterisk. I'll probably give it a 6 now. It's a weak series opener. That's the worst thing about it, is the fact that it's an opener. It's um, The production on it's quite sloppy. The geography's not great. There's some tonal whiplash. But I do enjoy it as a bit of fluff. Um, I sort of, you know, I've always been a big fan of the performances of Bailey Piper and David Tennant when they're being possessed by Cassandra I've always sort of enjoyed it's very 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 silly but there's just something about New Earth it's, maybe it's nostalgia it's very there's a charming element to it um, and I don't know it's just a bit of silly fun I just think that the fact I think I would like it more though if it wasn't the opener I think that's the biggest problem with it it yeah. should be like mid-series not opener and that's yeah that's a big flaw um, but you know what? I, whatever. Like, I'm I'm okay with it. Um, mm-hmm. That's why it's my number twelve. So yeah, Adam. Wait, no, hang on. Yeah, shit. Yeah, what's your number twelve? New Earth. Ah, there it is. Wait, you should have snap, snapped it. Were you? No, was that? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, then snap. Um, <laughs> um, the game is ruined. <laughs> I was oh, like, no. what the fuck have you put in number twelve? Um, Holy shit! No, New Earth. Yeah, New Earth. Yeah. Um. To be fair, I just recently switched it, like, this morning. Um, I just, if, go back and watch the video for why I don't like it, but it's just, it just doesn't sit right with me, but I find it slightly more watchable than Love and Monsters. Fair enough. All right, then. Your number 11, Jake? Love and Monsters. Oh, there it is. Um, I think you and I had a big discussion in, yeah. in the episode about, about, um, story, storytelling and, and editing and mm. dynamic, dynamics in in stories and for me i feel like compared to fear her and new earth and the idiot's lantern lover monsters has a more dynamically written story um and it's got 
a more interesting pace and character I, I i do like how the start to the finish is just this one character's viewpoint and it's like this outside looking in of the life and effects of the doctor and rose and i think it's it's an interesting concept and as someone who's new and fresh to the show and is watching it it's kind of cool to see what it's like to to see the effects of the doctor on everything else and it's like yeah it's like a it's like a like a meta episode in a way mm. yeah that's my cool right so um i'm next right from my number 11 yeah mm-hmm. um now i want to make something very clear because um whilst the rankings are mathematically where they are um those bottom three episodes i don't like edit slanton i'm half half on fear her and i enjoy new earth but i'm not particularly a big fan of it but everything from here up i love so like the top 10 11 i think it is the top 11 mm. is all episodes that i love that are part of my childhood that i deeply appreciate so even the next one that i'm about to say even though it's this far down it's actually very close to some of the ones that are ne- near it because for me this is just this is the point in series two that that, that these are the episodes that i are absolutely drawn to so my number 11 is tooth and claw um it's gothic horror it has david Tennant with a scottish accent it has a werewolf transformation scene it's got great humor it's very mature in the sense that the increased violence increasing the maturity of the rating um allows it to have some adult jokes in it like the doctor like pretending that he bought rose on the street that was hilarious yeah ah bought her for a few pence in london town that was great um yeah and i really i really think it's quite it's extremely well directed the blu-ray transfer is orgasmic to look at um i think it's just it's essential doctor for me it's um it's also got the russell t charm in the sense that it starts out with kung fu monks in scotland doing a slow motion jump over people with sticks and then it transforms into a gothic horror with a werewolf episode yet somehow it still works um and yeah i love the library scene with the doctor where he puts his glasses on and he says books the best weapons we can have and then i love the whole plot of the the fact that the uh was it the dead uh, victoria's dead husband um had the diamond and he knew that the wolf was real so there was a nice little plot in there yeah. and also the symbolism of the doctor and the wolf across from the wall of each other um yeah. it, it's a little precursor to doomsday um just overall a very very solid episode for me and the last time i watched it which wasn't actually with you it's with someone else i enjoyed every second of it i was thoroughly entertained so but i just think that with me i'm such a massive fan of most of series two's episodes that i had to put something here and I think comparatively, Tooth and Claw isn't as significant. Obviously, it does set up Torchwood, which is great. I love that bit at the end. But in terms of comparatively to other episodes, it's not quite as big. It's still very much a warm up episode, but I do thoroughly love it. So, your number 11. Fear her. This is interesting because I think we had a conversation about a week or two ago where you said this was your bottom. Yeah. But I've been thinking about it. And Idiot's Lantern, Love and Monsters and New Earth all make me feel gross. They they just... I don't know. There's something about them that just doesn't work for me. And it sort of makes me restless and I just, I just can't really stomach it, you know? Whereas Fear Her, I can. It's a much more digestible episode. Heavily flawed. And I'm not, you know, I, I, I have no particular interest in re-watching it but I just the reason why I put it above New Earth Love and Monsters and Idiot's Lantern is I find it much more digestible and watchable even though I think it's a very very weak episode yeah mm. is it time for your number 10 Jake? alright alright okay I'm gonna precursor this with oh, I know what this I, is I, I'm gonna precursor <laughs> this I know with, what this is I like different things um don't unsubscribe I'm sorry is this <laughs> is this, this series version of the Doctor Dancer's bombshell? um yeah. Uh, so number ten for me. Hey, still made it to top ten. That's so good. That's a redeeming quality. Out of fourteen episodes, <laughs> I made the top ten. It's Rise of the Cybermen. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't particularly like the Cybermen. Um, I think it's like the story was cool. Okay, I'm gonna put it this way. There was so much good shit in that in those in that two-parter. 
and the, you know but the whole like villain and you know all of that just was so goofy and uh, just not villainous in any way and I just didn't like I think it just I it was just I just didn't like it and so I think all of that shit with Mickey and Ricky and everyone and they on the, on, if that was like put into another episode with a villain that wasn't as you know if that was like a Dalek episode right the Daleks were in that episode instead of the Cybermen that would have been some crazy you shit you definitely have to change quite a lot about it though oh you 100% do mm. um you there'd be you know John Lumick and all that wouldn't be a thing anymore but and also yeah I'm gonna leave it at that alright yeah big bombshell yeah because I remember last time you put the Doctor Dancers below Boomtown and ANZ of London and people were like, what the fuck? Um, because you didn't like the um, the ending. Yeah. Like the, the big, hooray! That's pretty stupid. You're just, um, you're just miserable, aren't you? I know, someone hug me. <laughs> the Absorbaloff <laughs> will hug you. <laughs> and it'll be like a permanent hug. Yeah. Forever. Is it time for my number yes. 10? And I'll turn it to pavement slab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it time for my number 10? Yes. My number 10 is The Christmas Invasion. Snippity snap. Well, there we go then. Um, I love it. It's uh, the Sycorax <laughs> are hilarious and great and fantastic. Um, I love David Tennant's entrance. He's very, very funny, you know. I demand to know who you are. I don't know. And then, you know, all the stuff. And then you get the sword fight on the spaceship with the crowd on the balcony in his pajamas by the police box and he's just regenerated and he gets his hand cut off and then it comes back and then he presses a button with a satsuma and the sycorax <laughs> falls and then you get the big twist at the end with harriet jones blowing them up um which sort of sets up the doctors sort of hang on a second what's going on here you can't just kill them i just saved them it's brilliant um you know there's the scene where he says don't you think she looks tired systematically takes it out of power with a few words that's the really sets up them how manipulative this character can be um and it's just yeah it's an episode that i absolutely enjoy and i remember when we watched it with you jake it was just a fun ride it's it's fantastic i loved it yeah um yeah you see christmas invasion as well right yes um yeah. it's a lot of fun all the reasons you just said um it's a really solid pulpy great introduction to david Tennant. really snappy really fun Great Christmas special. It, everything it sets up to do, it really, really, really achieves. It's just not an overly ambitious episode, and I really enjoy it. Hmm. You're number nine. <laughs> Age of Steel. Snap. Oh, really? Mm. The first episode of Doctor Who I ever saw. Wow. You go ahead, Jake. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was like, I thought, no, I thought none of mine were going to be snapped from this point on. Okay. Um, again, uh, alongside the, the, the first part of the Sidemen part of um i the, there's a lot of things to it that i enjoy i just again i it, it just there's no threat to me there is a threat obviously because there's this being turned into cyberman but for me it just doesn't feel as uh uh like palpable you know it's just like it's not a i i just don't i it, I, it just doesn't do anything for me it's interesting that we snapped because my feelings are quite different yeah but I think that really goes to show how I feel about the series as a whole. Yeah. The fact that one of my favorite episodes is this low down. Because um, I remember when we when I talked about, uh, in the Series 1 review, when I talked about episodes like Aliens of London and Boomtown, it was very similar in the sense that I ranked them very low. But I love those episodes. So Age of Steel was the first episode of Doctor Who I ever saw. And it's got a very nostalgic place in my heart. Um, and I absolutely love Mickey's Exit. I love the the atmosphere of the scenes with the Cybermen's and the little tunnels. Uh, I think the Doctor is very fun in this. He's got um, a great little climax bit where he gives a big, I suppose you could call it a lecture, to John Lumick about humanity and um, what it means to be a Cyberman and what uh, how that becomes a problem. And overall, it's very action packed and it's got some very nice moments. There's a moment where one of the Cybermen dies and. Um, the Doctor basically reveals who this person was and where they came from, and it was, oh, it was quite emotional. And it's very action packed. It's got a big explosion at the end. It's very fun. Um, there's also a nice little moment when Rose calls Pete dad and he just walks away confused and angry because he's denying it. Um, 
yeah, it's a nice conclusion, but I think the other episodes that I've put above it, at least for me, have a little bit more substance. Um, but the main thing for me that I really love about Age of Steel is Mickey's exit. That's the big, yeah. big talking point. Um, but I think it's interesting that I've put it this low considering how much nostalgia I have considering it was my first ever episode. Mm. But it really, to me, it, it just echoes how, as I've gotten older, how I've come to appreciate the episodes that have a bit more character development in them rather than the action-packed ones like Age of Steel. Um, though I do love this. And I love the Cybermen. Mm-hmm. A lot. Your number nine? Tooth and Claw. It's fun. Really enjoyed it. Blu-ray transfer is gorgeous. The Scottish accents are a lot of a lot of um, fun. Um, I love the sort of gothic horror influence, and then some of the batshit stuff that's in the episode, like the ninjas and stuff. As incongruous as it is, it still makes for a very enjoyable viewing. Um, Doctor's really fun in it. Rose is great in it. Oh yeah. Um, I love it. Really, really, really love it, and that's why it's my number nine. What's your number eight, Jack? Mine's Tooth and Claw. There you go. Um, yeah, I I remember enjoying, yeah, the the themes, the gothic horror themes, the colors, um, the werewolf was done well as well, and the ninjas were cool. Um, was that something to do with like a big ass like fucking telescope? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I remember that being cool. They used. Oh yeah, the- and it goes onto a diamond, onto the yeah, yeah. onto the. Yeah. Queen's thingy. They used the they inverted the telescope so that the moonlight would go into the diamond, bounce off, and hit the wolf. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, obviously the Torchwood arc opened up in that episode as well. So it mm. opens up an arc through the series. So I think as as a episode, it's it's very contained, but still opens up some some avenues for the series. So I think it's um yeah, it was it was a fun episode. Yeah, I remember you also really appreciated the more like adult humor as well. Yeah, definitely. Um. And it was one that was dark and and mm. like I uh, and it was it, but it was done yeah. in a good way. That that werewolf transformation scene makes my skin crawl. Yeah, it's very pretty narrowly creepy. My number is it my number eight? I think yep. so. My number eight is Rise of the Cybermen. Snap. So the reason why I've put it above the Age of Steel is because it's got like I said when I was talking about it before, Rise of the Cybermen has a lot more character focus than Age of Steel. It's a lot less action packed. Um, it also builds up the reveal of the Cybermen, which I really like. I just the one thing I would say though is I wish that the the, the the title of the episode was different. There's yeah. a reason why I didn't let you see it because right. it, it just reveals what the villain is, which completely destroys all the tension that builds up to it. Mm. Um, I know that why they did it though, because obviously advertising you want people to watch the show, and it did get a lot of viewers. But for me personally, as someone who appreciates art over business, um, I wish it was called something else. But I really enjoyed John Lumick, um, Roger Lloyd Pack's hammy performance. There's some really uh, like lines that I love that I remember from that, like "How would you do that from beyond the grave?" And then you've also got the line at the end where it's like, "It seems like an appropriate time to say that I've crashed the party." <laughs> that was very funny. Yeah. Um, and there's also the scene where the the um, the people are being just k- sliced up and massacred and turned into Cybermen, but it's playing the lo- like the lion. The Lion Sleeps Tonight. The Lion King. Yeah, The Lion Sleeps Tonight um, at the same time. But the main reason why I put it there is because this is the episode where we get Mickey meeting his grandmother again and also being captured by the the, the group with his twin and also Jake and the other woman. Um, but also we, this is an episode where Rose gets to meet Parallel, Pete and Jackie. I just find those scenes particularly um, interesting in the sense that she's meeting her dead father yet it's not him it's a parallel version it's a nice like it's quite a different dynamic than father's day mm. and also the joke the fact that in the parallel universe rose is a dog that's hilarious um i would say the doctor though i would say maybe the doctor's a little bit too nondescript in this he's not particularly in he's not particularly big within this story but uh, he sort of takes a back seat though um purposely um but yeah, I think that's the main reason why I put Rise over Age of Steel is because of its focus on the characters. Um, but I do really like both parts pretty much equally. So yeah, why, why is Rise of the Sidemen your number eight? Um, for all the reasons you said, the the thing is though, I'll get to Age of Steel later. The reason I put Age of Steel above Rise of the Sidemen is um, I agree with you. Normally I'm much more into character than action and stuff, but um, 
Rise of the Cybermen is great atmospheric, the character stuff is brilliant, I love it, everything you just said, except for the fact that Age of Steel as a child, it's purely a nostalgia thing for why Age of Steel is higher, Age of Steel was the first Doctor Who episode to give me nightmares as a child. Age of Steel fucked me up. Mm. Um, specifically because of the scene um, when you find, like, when they, you know, find people they know have turned into Cybermen. Right. And that just, that concept fucked me up. <laughs> um, so I, uh, that's the only reason I put Age of Steel above Rise of the Cybermen. I think I'm, I think I'm too old for, for the Cybermen. That's the thing. That's fair enough, but I just think as a concept for me, losing autonomy, losing yeah. control, losing your own vices and becoming part of a hive mind where all individuality is lost terrifies me. Yeah. So that's why Rise of the is my number eight. All right. What's your number seven? My number seven. I've had to do a reshuffle here because I realized um, I, I like other episodes better than the other one. Um, a school reunion. Right. Okay. Um. Now, I think School Reunion is different for people that know about Sarah Jane before. Mm, there is an element of that, yes. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, and I don't l- like... I I, th- I can't remember a lot of it, but I remember liking the humorous sides of it with the dog, with Mickey. Um, I remember liking the doctor in it, and I also remember liking... I'm, I don't remember liking Rose in it, actually. Yeah, um, she's quite... Teenagey, yeah, yeah, because obviously she's sort of competing with Sarah Jane a bit. Yeah, but I remember you did say that despite that, you enjoyed the humorous moments between them. Yeah, definitely the sort of catty bits. I mean, it's still pretty high up on the list. I I do remember that. I do remember it being one of the ones that sat pretty well with me. And um, yeah, is it time for my number seven? Yeah, <laughs> my number seven is the wonderful Love and Monsters. Wonderful is a subjective term. Is it? Very. <laughs> Love and Monsters. So, this is an episode that every time I watch it, it gets better. Uh, what the fuck? <laughs> yep, it does. Um, <laughs> I absolutely adore Love and Monsters. If you remember in the review, I gave it a 9 out of 10. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It's so unique in the sense that it's a love letter to fans but it's also an episode that showcases what people do outside of the doctor's travels it's got some really really hilarious comedy it's got a brilliant exploration into jackie's life when rose isn't there um it's got such a tight script with great little comedic twists in it um and it's just so up my alley the kind of humor that it has in it the way it's so it reminds me of being a kid again, you know, I think I said in the review about how the kind of humor that Love and Monsters has mm. is very much the kind of thing that I would go around doing and saying when I was, you know, in, high, in early high school or late primary school. It's extremely silly, but it really touches a place for me that is memorable and something that I really appreciate. And um, it's so meta and so beyond the script that it just really charms me in a way that is unique to any other episode. Um, and I just love it. It's so cool for me. Um, and every time I watch it, I've always got like a massive grin on my face from the moment it starts to the moment it ends. So yeah, it's just one of those personal favorites for me. I just, Fair enough. It's one of those episodes that really hits me in a way. What's your number seven? Oh, I think I know what this is based on your expression. Army of Ghosts. Oh. Oh. Yeah. It's good. Really good episode with one of the best fucking cliffhangers in the entire show. I don't know what Jake's reaction is to the, the cliffhanger, but it's one of my favorite cliffhangers. I love it so much. Um, the character stuff's great. The the forward momentum of the episode's great. The concept of it begins with where you're like, what are these sort of phasing ghost things? And then you realize, are they Cybermen? Great. Lots of fun. Really enjoy it. Um, it's a solid episode. Not much more I can say. I just think it's much better than all the episodes beneath it. Um, but not as good as those above it. Interesting. We'll have to get into that when we get to the other ones. Yes. Is it time for your number six, Jake? It is. Um, and that would be Christmas Invasion. Hey! I, I mean, I mean, objectively, it's not the best episode, you know? It's like, but there is a lot of shit in it that's like, uh, you know, it, it is very important to the, to the story. Mm. Obviously, it's literally David Tennant's first 
time as yeah. the doctor and his his uh, arrival on the scene yeah and did you miss me there's just so much funny shit in it and <laughs> and just ridiculousness and i think i just liked it because it it was just stupid and um <laughs> and I don't, I don't know i just found that more enjoyable than so there's there's two ways you can go about like seriousness in a in an episode you can go serious like i'm your ghost and doomsday and stuff like that and, you know you can go like full serious plot and it'll, it can work out it can pan out or you can go just really stupid but sort of injects like a little a couple of little plot points in here as well and that can work really well as well so what you're trying to say but is that that Christmas doesn't work in something like fear her or something like that mm. um but i think like this is one of those moments where it's like it could have failed it could have been really bad it could have really turned to shit but i don't know it just worked what you're trying to say is is that this is like a really pulpy episode for you no it's not oh i'm saying the opposite oh. i'm saying it's 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 like uh it's pretty basic episode but it's done really well but it's just fucking funny mm. yeah yeah. it's executed with a certain level of professionalism that just like he's having a fucking sword fight on a spaceship in his pajamas for fuck's sake and he beats him with a satsuma which yes. he set up earlier in the episode exactly like... by the fact that Jackie's boy toy has satsumas in his dressing gown oh it's yeah. just it's just it's just funny it's classic yeah. Russell T in it yeah yeah, yeah. It's, just, right. it's just and I think that's a nice surprise considering that it's a Christmas episode because you usually don't like Christmas themed no. stuff but the fact that it's this high of the list for you, yeah. I think it really speaks volumes about... I barely had any Christmas theme stuff in it. Anyway. Well, I had the Christmas tree flying, but that was hilarious, because Jackie's like, I'm going to get killed by a Christmas tree! Yeah. Anyway. Uh, does that mean it's my number yes. six? Yes, it is. I just need to remind myself what it is, because there's a lot of them that are like ranked quite close to each other. What could possibly be above Love and Monsters? Uh, my number six is School Reunion. Love School Reunion. It's... Um, brilliant. I love Sarah Jane, obviously. I love the Doctor in it. It's the first episode in Series 2. We properly get the Doctor as a character fleshed out, and he feels connected to the rest of them in the sense that I think Sarah Jane really brings out a side of the character that feels like other Doctors. I really like that. Um, there's so many memorable scenes in this for me. I remember when... Because before this, like a couple, few days ago, I cut together a highlights package of Jake's reactions to all the episodes before Impossible Planet so that he could remind himself of what he thought of them. Um, and I remember when I was cutting together School Reunion, I was looking through the reactions of it that we did, and there's just so many scenes in that episode that are memorable for me in, in, in the sense in the sense that um, you get stuff like uh, when Sarah Jane walks into the room when she introduces like the new... Um, sort of as she's investigating the school mm. um, you know might I introduce Miss Sarah Jane Smith and you get just this wonderful shot of the doctor David Tennant's performance turning around just seeing her after all these years I just love how how much contained glee he has mm. in seeing her but he has to obviously not let it out because he's trying to he's keeping undercover yeah um, you also get the scene where Sarah Jane finds the TARDIS and realises that it's the doctor it's a beautiful scene uh, what else is there? There's the scene by the swimming pool between the Doctor and Mr. Finch, played by Anthony Stewart Head. It's powerful, very powerful acting between the two. I, uh, like I said, the um, Anthony Stewart Head as the villain playing Mr. Finch, the Krillotain. I just love him so much. His performance is so he's he's chewing the scenery, but he's still menacing at the same time. Mm. Um, and also the the fact that like they're sort of harvesting children for knowledge is really fucked up. Uh, there's also a scene when he's tempting the Doctor to use this technology to bring back Gallifrey, like almost to, like to lure him in, but then obviously you get Sarah Jane who walks in and says that, you know, pain and loss are part of us, it's what makes us grow as people, and it's it's just very powerful from a character point of view. And then of course you get all the all the shit with K9 and Mickey, which is just funny. We are in a car. Um, I love Scorin, and so, yeah. It's pretty. It's really good for me. I think just the ones I've ranked above it are like they're at a different level of intensity, because School Reunion is very much a small episode, but a very for me it's a very good one. Uh, in fact, in fact for me it's a great one. But I think the other episodes are have bigger balls and are more ambitious. Um, but that being said, I I love it, all my heart. What's your number six? Doomsday. 
Damn. It's very good. It's great to see the Daleks and the Cybermen face off. That's incredible. That's part of the, one of the main reasons it's so high up on the list. That being said... I think people know my feelings towards the beach scene. And I just once the story finishes, it goes on for a bit too long afterwards and it's meandering. I know it's wrapping up the arcs, but you, a lot of that could have has already been done in a lot of ways. You know, Jackie's with Pete, you know, they, they've reconciled and she's with him in the parallel world. And then Rose has her family over there. She's got Mickey over there. And, and uh, I don't know, it just doesn't pack the emotional punch for me that it does for a lot of other people. I get why it's a lot of people's favorite finale and stuff like that, but it just doesn't quite do it for me as it does for a lot of other people. That being said, it's perfectly balanced with the action and drama, it's just the drama doesn't really do it for me. So that's why it's number six, but I still think it's a very, very, very good episode. All right then. What's your number five, Jake? The Impossible Planet. Ah. No snaps? Nope. All right. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Let me just have a look. Uh, no, no. No, I'm not snapping. Okay. Um, yeah, I, Possible Planet was one of the more recent ones we've watched, so it's kind of more fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was really good. The Ood were an interesting character because they hadn't become villains yet, technically. They're not really villains. They're just they're taken over by the beast at some point. And then I think, I think also just... I, I do like that concept of just space space um, and well you wanted some alien terrain and, and you finally got it yeah, yeah. and uh, you know just the de like I think I compared it to Riddick quite a bit in the um, in the review and, and Adam compared it to Event Horizon and Riddick yes. Riddick is one of one of well Pitch Black is one of my favourite films yeah, it's great even though it's not a very good film but it's still <laughs> one of my favourite films um, so yeah I think it was one of the one of the one of those episodes that hit everything that I kind of had been waiting for in in the series and yeah it it quenched my thirst mm. so to speak yep. yeah my number five is Army of Ghosts it's a very tight build up episode it's got I think I said in the review it's got a very early 2000s sci-fi vibe to it that I really love like with all the the graphs on screen they had like the weird little pie charts and there was like levers and stuff it's very classic sci-fi um i really like the torchwood base and it's all its artifacts and you got like characters like yvonne hartman which is they're very obscure but i really i also like the little sub story under it of like adiola and gareth and the other guy um like they're having their little flirty texts to each other over the work email but then mm. it leads to them being becoming cybermen because it's like they're it's slowly feeding in the Cybermen returning and they're sort of chewing off members of Torture one at a time so that they can gain control of all of the um, levers and the computers and stuff so they can make their full um, transition over. Which again, that's another thing I absolutely love, the fact that the ghosts turn out to be Cybermen and it's all because of um, this gap uh, between universes that was created by the Void Ship. Um, through the through the, I suppose you could say it's the yeah it's not the rift it's like a but it's kind of like a rift in a way it's like it's like a, an artificial one yeah um, the doctor is fucking phenomenal in this there's a scene where he he's telling Yvonne to stop the what well, I think I can't remember what the word is for it but they were about to do something and he tells her to stop and she refuses yeah. and then he does this the reverse psychology by sitting in the chair staring her right in the face basically saying if you continue it through with this everything's going to shit and she sort of just realizes and stops it it's a very powerful scene yeah um i really really like the whole thing of jackie wanting to have mem family members back because obviously as we saw in love of monsters she's very lonely and the fact that she saw this ghost as her dead father is very impactful um in the sense that the doctor has to come in and say well the reality is it's not true and i'm sorry that that's the one thing you want and you can't have it but it's true it's a very um bittersweet sense uh, of that concept um what else is there there's i mean the the mickey's return is really fun as well uh, the fact that he disguised himself as samuel and you know rajesh singh thought that rose was like she's like hey i can read that psychic paper is blank because we're trained to um 
see these people as fake, but then he didn't see Mickey through. That was mm. really cool. And then, as you said, the cliffhanger with the Daleks coming up the void ship yeah. is one of my absolute favorites in the whole show. Um, yeah, Army of Ghosts is a very, very, very tightly written story, one I absolutely enjoy. But the ones above it for me are just like top tier Doctor Who for me. So, mm. yeah, that's why it's my number five. Uh, we're low on battery, is that okay? Yeah, we've got another battery right there. Okay, cool. Your um, number five. Age of Steel. So, character-wise, it's nowhere near as good as its predecessor, and probably its successes in the finale. But, as a child, the Cybermen were my favourite Doctor Who monster, and they still kind of are. Um, it's shifted to be, you know, some other monsters, um, but the Cybermen are still one of my favourites. Um, and this episode is just pure Cyberman carnage. It's a fun adventure that's constantly moving. David Tennant's on fire. The cast are really fun. Mickey gets at the time what seemed like his closure and then obviously he comes back for a little bit like a little bit of an epilogue almost but at the time it's a really tight fun fast script with some great moments and some genuine stuff that fucked me up as a child um really fun it's a bit of a blockbuster it's a bit of schlock but i really really enjoy it what's your number four jake oh it's uh satan's pit the satan pit yeah um yeah it's uh, it's you know it's a pretty good end to the to the two parter and you know I, I to be honest I don't know what I put it well, no um I I think it is right being above the impossible planet um the ending's like very epic and all that there's a there's a couple of like plot like flaws that I, I remember pointing out that kind of irk me but I think it's it was one of those episodes with like having the doctor away from rose and rose up here and you know there's that whole humanity him questioning the morals of humans and stuff like that as well and there's a lot of uh just really well done themes in that episode and uh, it was very enjoyable Mm. Mm. and it was quite epic Mm. my number four is doomsday so before we did the review it was like a 9.5 but then I remember when we watched it again and we like really soaked it in and thought about it it bumped up to a 10 I ended up giving it a 10 just but I did give it Um, because the very 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 small like little problems I have with Doomsday were justified from a character point of view and actually won me over one example of that is how did Pete know how to to how to um, travel between the walls if you know he could, could he actually see what was happening with Rose or was it just pure luck that was one little little niggle I had but at the same time when you think about where the characters were right before when we last saw them in the parallel universe and the, the conversation that Jackie or Pete were having the implication it has on him as a character I absolutely love because it really shows him finally accepting Rose as his daughter mm. after denying it it's it's very very powerful in terms of everything else i absolutely love it the Simon vs the daleks is one of my favorite childhood memories you know the the bitch fight of canary wharf you could say is a famous little scene and the banter between them is hilarious it's a dream come true for a doctor who fanboy to see these two iconic monsters face off um what else is there there's it's a very very tight story with a very fast moving pace it's got great action it has um, a very powerful dramatic um, tension and I'm always sucked in by it it's one of those episodes that just wins me over and um, unlike Adam I actually do like the beach scene so yeah I, I'm, I'm very I'm very pulled in by it and um, it just reminds me of a happy time in my life so yeah very epic very emotional very powerful and very enjoyable and it's top tier for me but it's not it's not above the next three because for me the next three are just on a different level Mm -hmm. but I still scraped a 10 in the review so there you go Doomsday is my number four what's your number four? School Reunion it bumped up since we watched it the last time just because of its significance with Sarah Jane meeting the Doctor again and it's a nice proper link to the classic series there's some stuff I didn't like about it but in terms of how 
I enjoyed the episode and also just the impact it has as well. It's just too significant for me to put it lower than the Sidemen stories, which I do enjoy, but I think this is just a more key element for the Doctor, um, making him question his morals a bit, and it's it's just... The drama works better for me in School Reunion than it does in something like Doomsday, and it's still a very entertaining episode with some lovely fan service. Right. Jake, what is your number three? Now, granted, I can't really remember this episode very well because we watched it so long ago, um, but I do remember it being very good, and a lot of things in it I enjoyed. Um, so number three is A Girl on the fire, Fireplace. A Girl on the Fireplace, yeah. Um what did I rate that? 8.5. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Your, rain, your ratings are a little bit inconsistent because of how lenient or harsh you are. Look, I, you know, but it I, depends what mood I'm in. Yeah, but I think the main thing you took away from that was you were a bit worried because um, Stephen Moffat in Series 1 did the Empty Child of Dr. Dancers, which you loved the concept and the villain for, but didn't like some of the execution in the sense that it went for a different tone than you'd like. Mm. But then with Girl in the Fireplace, it was a far more somber ending, mm. and you really and it really resonated with you. I remember you said that. So um, anyway... Yeah. yeah, so I think putting it as number three is makes sense for me because um, it is still memorable after all this time, after not watching it. Um, and yeah, I obviously I can't say much on it because I remember there being some, some like mirrors they traveled through. Yeah, so there was a, a door between the spaceship in the future and yeah. pre-revolutionary France. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a, re- there was a horse in, yeah. on the spaceship. There's a lot. Yep. And it, yeah. I'll get, I'll get on to that later, but have you got anything else to say? No. No? Okay, sure. Does that mean it's time for my number three? Yep. My number three is The Impossible Planet. Yep. So, The Impossible Planet, fucking great episode. It sets up the Ood, it has the Beast, it has the space station with all the brilliant side characters, the Doctor and Rose are on fire. Um, it's an all-round phenomenal piece of television for me. It's so difference to everything else we'd seen before this and knew who it's on a space station it's got a great atmosphere and a great soundtrack it's genuinely scary with uh toby zeb being taken over by the beast um mm. i love the otherworldly look and style of it i love all the you know just the fact that it revolves around a black hole is really interesting so many different concepts in there that i love and it's a fantastically executed episode um but i will get on to why the next one is above it yeah see why um i agree really really fun episode um really well written a complete change of pace from series two up to that point um really like the sort of unknown element to it the mystery um really really solid love the impossible planet right your number two jake my number two is army of ghosts um i think you guys covered it already pretty well and that uh it's got one of the best for me i think it was one of the best paced episodes in this series and the cliffhanger was very very well done Mm. um i was captivated throughout this whole two-parter um the only reason putting this below the other one is because uh it's a first parter Mm -hmm. yeah fair enough very much the build up to the second (laughs) yeah but but it's still like brilliantly done Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. My number two is the Satan Pit. Snap. Um, I love the Satan Pit as much as the Impossible Planet. The reason why I put it above this is the way it explores the Doctor's character. Um, through not only you get the scene with him ascending into the abyss, but also descending. descending sorry, descending to, into the abyss, but also when he ascend into an abyss. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, if the gravity's right, anyway, it doesn't matter. Would it be ascending if it's against the black hole? Who knows? Anyway, it's been short. it was descending into the abyss. Those scenes are fantastic. And also the scene before that when he when he's like, come on, come on, come on, come on. The urge to jump in. Will I take that risk? Uh, and also the scenes where he confronts the beast. It's a, it's a big, big episode for the Doctor as a character. The way it challenges his religious views and so a concept that is beyond Time Lord knowledge. Uh, it's dark, it's scary, it's action-packed, it's terrifying, it's atmospheric, very well directed, very well acted, very well scored. Overall, just a masterpiece for part two. Um, so I just love it. Satan Pit number two. And you too. Um, yeah, Satan Pit, it's exactly what you said. It's 
a little bit more of a hokey episode than the last one. However, the Doctor stuff just triumphs over everything else. It is incredible. I love the exploration of his psyche and the, the, the visuals of it and everything like that. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Mm. That's why it's my number two. All right. Your number one, Jake. My number one is obviously Doomsday. Um, Ew. And you gave that a 10. I did give that a 10. I think that is possibly the only 10 I gave this series. Mm. Um, as a new fan, um, watching Doomsday is quite exciting. And because there's, I'm watching it from a point of view where I have no clue what's happening. So um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of it was uh, very revolutionary to mm. me in the series um you got two villains clashing and then one of the villains stops being a villain be an ally and then but then you get rid of them both and then you got like another plot line going this way and it was a very well crafted episode probably one of the most brilliantly thought out um two-parters i think the most brilliantly thought out two-parters uh from this this series i think impossible planet santa pit it's very close behind it for me um but yeah i think i think I, I i touched it in the in the review that uh the the way that this story was laid out with a linear like build mm-hmm. up to it and then there's just insanely unraveling intertwining story between these two different mm. villains and you know it, it just it was very well done and that is part, that's why it's my number one. Yeah. I think you said that you you like the series two finale two part just as much as the series one finale two part. I do, and mm. I, I I do agree with Adam on 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 the beach scene being, uh, fucking, you know, too much of a bow tie on mm. top of it. You know, like a lot of the time I think you you don't need to wrap a present up that fucking tight. Mm. You, you know, it, you can just you can let it be, let it breathe. But um, I think you also brought up some good points in the time that it was released. I think Russell T. Davies decided mm. that he didn't want such a melancholic... This was in the trivia. He was like, he didn't want it to end on such a sour note. Yeah. Um, and I think that makes sense. It be- does. Because it is TV and it's going to be yeah. shown to so many people. And it's a family show. It's but like, still, it's cool. like a director's cut version of that of that yeah. episode would be awesome. Mm. Yeah. But that being said, even even though you do say that, I remember in the review you said in, 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 in isolation you did like the beach scene in isolation. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I, it's still a great scene. There's nothing bad about the scene. Um, I just don't think it's necessary. Yeah. I, it is... Okay. I, I don't, don't think it's necessary... I just don't think it can be there. Like, it doesn't... It You can... It's sort of just like... The story ends and then it, it's just like... But wait! Yeah. And then... And then there's like a nice end. It still is a nice it's end. It's more like an epilogue to the yeah, series. Yeah, it's like... Those. It's like, end. But wait, there's more. Mm. Well, could, could this be... Oh, no, it's just... Oh, whatever. Yeah. And then there's a random woman. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah. My number one, and if you can do the math, it's yours too is the girl in the fireplace. Moffat. Genius. Moffat is a genius when he's Off focused. Off the hat to Moffat. Off the hat to Moffat. Um, controversially, I like this more than The Empty Child of Doctor Dances. Ditto. Which is a rare opinion, but I do. It's fucking great. It mixes two genres in Doctor Who that are my favourites, that being a, a historical and a futuristic sci-fi blended into one. It's not a mess. It's sublime the clockwork droids are frightening madame de pompadour gets an entire character arc within one episode it explores the doctor brilliantly it has brilliant direction great music like we said murray gold's track is phenomenal um mickey is great comedic relief as is rose but she also interestingly there's a scene in which she confronts madame de pompadour about relationships with the doctor but it actually feels very mature, which is unlike her. It's interesting that it turned out that way. But there was something very poetic about how she handled that scene. Um, there's also some really funny co- comedic moments in it, um, like <laughs> when the Doctor gets drunk. Um, but yeah, I just I love the four act structure. I said this in the review. It has a four act structure. It has the introduction as the child. It has the middle section when the Doctor and Madame de Pompadour are sort of adventuring and sort of discovering this romantic connection they have, which is a very bizarre one because it's spread through time for her, especially mm. in the sense that she sees him as his, like, her imaginary romantic lover. 
Um, and then you sort of get a climax to the clockwork droid story where he comes through the mirror on the horse and it's hilarious and great and fantastic. It's got a great um, technical sci-fi plot as well in the sense that it was um, a ship that was programmed to look for parts titled Madame de Pompadour. It has this window into time that it looks for her in the past, thinking that her body parts would fix the ship. It's literally a software glitch, same as Empty Child Doctor Dances was, um, but it's done through a time jump, which is fucking so creative. And then obviously Act 4, which is the little extra bit at the end, which was a bit unexpected, is the sense that the Doctor wants to take her away on a travel. Goes in the fireplace, she says no, he's looking at her like, wait, what? And then it's too late because the yeah. fireplace has already turned. He comes back and she's dead. Yeah. And he's left with a letter posthumously to her. And because of the time loop and how the physics of time travel work, he can't go back and see her because it would be a paradox. Yeah. because it's her death is a fixed point and everything that happened in between is all fixed so doing yeah. that would upset it so there's a genuinely dramatic consequence to the entire thing and it's all done within 45 minutes it's brilliant it's so good it's one of my favorite episodes of doctor who i've ever seen your turn i agree very convincing romance story a beautiful soundtrack the editing is just sublime the st- the, the story is watertight and it could have gone so wrong so easily because it's kind of batshit insane. Pre-revolutionary France trapped inside a spaceship. You know, that's bonkers. But it works really well in the incremental growth of the character that we see of Madame de Pompadour through the Doctor's eyes and through the Companion's eyes. The organic elements to the ship with the eyeball. It's just so creative, so clever. And it's satisfying. It's just a really satisfying singular episode to sit down and watch any time. It's also my dad's favorite episode of New Who. Um, it's just brilliant, and I absolutely adore it. Yep. Well, there we go. That's our rankings. Wow. Okay. Moving on from that. Oh, yeah, by the way, there'll be a poll in the description for you guys to vote for your favorite episode. Uh, let's ha- let's have a look at what they voted for for Series 1. So for Series 1, Adam and I chose Dalek, and you chose Bad Wolf. Um, let's see what the audience voted for. Ooh. Ooh, it's tie. It's a tie between Dalek and the Parting of the Ways. Wow! And then Empty Child is very close behind, as is Father's Day, as is Bad Wolf, and the Doctor dances. It's all very neck and neck. Mm. Very consistently brilliant series that is. I might add. Um, what did we think of the story arc of series two, the Torchwood arc? Um, yeah, it was. It wasn't. I don't think it was as big of an influence as the Bad Wolf arc, for sure. Um, it still was there, and I think it was, it didn't have that big of a impact. Well, it did. did. Like, it did have, like, it was, they were in the Torchwood Institute yep. at the, at the end, yeah. of, end of the series. But, in the way that the Bad Wolf one worked. Well, what I'm, what I was about to refer to was in the, when we talked about, I think it was in the Army of Ghosts review, about the fact that I quite like how, as opposed to Bad Wolf, the Torchwood thread is actually not what the arc is because it's obviously there's the word repeated torchwood like bear wolf was but then you come to realize that it's not actually torchwood that's the reveal it's actually the the daleks and the cybermen yeah it was a big slight of hand yeah so it's almost like you're like you an army of ghosts you're like oh oh that's torchwood okay uh i was waiting for that and now it's here okay what what what, what, what's happening here yeah but then you see the void sphere and then you see the ghosts and then everything starts to creep in and unfold and then it's revealed that the actual arc of this series is building to something that's different to what was suggested. And yeah. it's quite a it's a bit of a subversive way of doing things, but I think it's executed brilliantly. So yeah, that's, I think it was that's how done, I feel. I think it was done pretty well. Mm. Yeah. But I will agree that the Bad Wolf one did have quite a big impact yeah. when it came to that two parter. Um what are your thoughts on the Torchwood arc? It's good. It's not as uh bombastic as the bad wolf one is it's kind of lower key it's more obvious it's more blatant mm. um i really like actually in tooth and claw how it, um queen victoria started it because of the events yeah and that, the yeah. thing that like in series two by what i mean by it being more obvious is the fact that it's set up earlier that that's what's mm. going on because it, it by the end it's really clear that bad wolf is a thing in series one but with series two torchwood is kind of dripped throughout the whole thing it's through the dna of the season um, and it's really good and it pays off in a satisfactory way where Torchwood is like the third element in this big war between these three factions in Doomsday mm. 
And I also really like how it, it sets up the spin-off. Yeah. So yeah, um, that was cool. Anyway, what's next? Let's have a look. Uh, okay. Give your conclusion and a rating out of 10 for series two. Uh, um, my conclusion is that, um, like I said at the start of this, um, series two was was good. It, it wasn't great. It had its ups and it had, had its downs. It had its very big highs, had its very big lows. I think there was some very experimental things done in this uh, in this series. They didn't really pan out most of the time. Um, and there were some, some interesting ideas um, and some very brilliant storytelling and and uh, very competent ways of, of use of time and sci-fi themes. Um, so I'm saying that I'll probably give this series a 8 out of 10. So one point lower than series one, because you go that and nine. So yep. it's like a notch below. All right, uh, you go second. It's a solid series, but as Jake said, high highs, low lows. It's very wishy-washy and inconsistent. When it's good, it's really good. When it's bad, it's kind of unbearable for me, personally. Um, I really enjoy it on the whole. It's kind of a fun blockbustery season with a couple of really good emotional moments sprinkled throughout and go on the fireplace being brilliant. Um, seven out of ten, really. Actually, sorry, seven point five out of ten, really strong, but nothing mind blowing. Right. So, um, I love this series. Ten out of the sorry, eleven out of the fourteen episodes, and if you include the Christmas special, I uh, some of my favourites in the whole show. Yeah, there's some pretty naff filler in there, but even within that filler, in episodes like Fear Her and New Earth, there's parts I really enjoy to them. There's only really one episode in this that I really don't like, and that's the Idiot's Lantern, which does bring things down a little bit because it does upset the characters slightly. But apart from that one big sort of chunk of shit in the road, um, I really, really, really do love Series 2 a lot. Um, I don't think it's as good as Series 1, but that the, the thing is with that is Series 1 is my absolute favorite. So it's kind of comparing side by side. It's a little bit unfair. But I do hold Series 2 in a very high regard. And after re-watching some of these episodes like Fear Her and Doomsday and my scores going up for them, my score for Series 2 has gone up as well. So I'm going to give it a 9.2 out of 10. 9.2? Damn, we're yep. in some decimals. Yeah. Now, the thing is, another thing I'm going to have to address as well. In the Series 1 recap, I gave it a 9.6. But I have rewatched Series 1 since then. And I have found that I have grown to love a few more episodes than before. Right. Specifically, The Unquiet Dead, Aliens of London, World War Three. Uh, and Boomtown. Uh, so, f and the biggest example of that being Unquiet Dead. When we first reviewed that, I gave that a six point five. If you were to ask me now, I'd give that an eight. It really bumped up in my mind. It's on like tooth and claw tier now. Um, so I, again, like I said, it was my favorite. It's even more my favorite now. It's just one of those series I watch over and over and over again and love it even even more I, every time I watch it. It's brilliant. So my. Score for series one is going to change from 9.6 to 9.9. .9. The only reason why I can't give it a full 10 is because of Adam Mitchell. And that's it. That's the only reason. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just gone up in my mind. So yeah, uh, but 9.2 for series two is my score, which is higher than I initially thought it would be. But it's purely because of how my thoughts changed of, changed of a few episodes on rewatch. So yeah. Yeah, really strong for me. Um, now, let's see... Jake, are you looking forward to series three, and what would you like to see? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I guess we're, we're it's gonna still be on Tenant. I've already watched two episodes of the series. Have you? You saw Blink. I know that. I've seen Midnight. It's later. Oh, I've not seen two. I've seen one episode of the series already. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm just. It's always hard to answer this because it's I. I don't know what I want. You, you, I would imagine, um, because obviously Rose is gone now. Well, yeah, well, have I to want get... to know who the fuck Catherine Tate is going to be in this. <laughs> show. Um, uh, but it's like, do I want another companion? I mean, Doctor Who always has a companion, but what if he doesn't have a companion for a series? How mm. about that? How would that go? 
I don't know. Maybe that'd be cool to find out. Mm. That could be something. So, really, to answer your question, I'm kind of happy with whatever. Okay. Oh, okay. So cool. you're, you're you're satisfied with Davy's version of the show so far to the point where you're willing to give him a chance with anything. Yep. That's cool. That's that's always good to hear. Um. Well, in terms of what comes next, if it's Doctor Who, it'll be the 2006 Christmas special, The Runaway Bride, featuring Catherine Tate. Oh. But do you not like Catherine Tate? Have you seen her before? No, I was just like, if that's a, if that's really all she is, like just the Christmas special. Uh, well, it's called The Runaway Bride because she is a bride. Yeah. What What do you what 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 about what I said was her being exclusive to one episode? Well, I mean, she could just be exclusive to one episode, you know? That's okay. It. All right, then. Are you trying to spoil it for me? I'm, I'm asking you why you asked me that, because I have no idea how we got that from. Because she could just be for one episode. I know. I don't know. I haven't seen it, so okay, I'm just whatever. making assumptions. Anyway, it sounds confusing. Um, but if it's Doctor Who, it'll be the 2006 Christmas special, The Runaway Bride. Mm-hmm. If it's Torchwood, it'll be Series 1, Episode 1, Everything Changes. Um, so obviously I asked you about series three and you said you're happy with whatever. Um, when it comes to Torchwood, any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> you have no idea. Absolutely no, no clue what's I mean, I guess it will be surrounding Torchwood and the alternate. No, it's not. I don't know. Yeah, I, I suppose you'll see. I have no clue. Because, yeah. because if you remember, um, the Torchwood that was in the series two finale was destroyed yeah. and, all, and all the people in it died. Yeah, but the one in the alternate universe, isn't it? I suppose that's true, isn't it? I guess we'll have to wait and find out. We'll have to wait and find out. But uh, yeah, those are what's coming up for Jake. Torchwood, Everything Changes, and Doctor Who, The Runaway Bride. Is there anything else we want to say before we wrap up this recap? Hope you all enjoyed these reactions. Hope you liked watching Series 2. And I hope you all enjoyed the extended calendar. 31 days in a row of videos. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's to our Patreon supporters. Yay. Like myself. Yay. Happy yes. New Year's, Jake. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we will see you all next time for The Runaway Bride and Everything Changes.